Let's uh, all stand and uh, say the pledge. Good. You want to move? You want to be the one that moves? The flag is hidden down there. Right? 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bethel, do this roll call. Clinton Barris. Here. Joe Weatherby. Yes. Chris Berg. Carolyn McLaughlin. Here. Jeff Kramer. Justin Bruland. Jack Perlette. Here. Bruce Frerer. Ben Daughtry. Linda Kruska. Dave Vandenbosch. George Garrett. Chad Berg. Mimi Stafford. David Hawtop. Here. Don Kincaid. Here. Bob Smith. Here. Stephen Leopold. <coughs> Rob Harris. Here. Pete Frezza. Jerry Lorenz. David Makepeace. Susie Roebling. Here. Corey Malcolm. Diana Sylvia. Rob Mitchell. Elena Rodriguez. <coughs> Martin Moe. Here. Alex Grosky. Ken Niedemeyer, Jessica Dockery, George Nugent, Andy Newman, Bruce Popham, Here. Kenneth Redup, Here. David Vaughn, Here. Shelley Kruger, Ed Barham, Here. Kenny Blackburn, Pat Bradley, Bill Goodman, Here. Uh, Captain David Dupre, Here. John Hunt, Here. Heather Blau, Nancy Finley, Karen Rain, Joanna Walzak, <coughs> Christopher Kavanaugh. So I suspect we're going to have some stragglers coming in and hopefully we'll have a full house. We have a quorum. Yeah. A little thin today, all the way at the end of the world. Okay, Billy. Glad you could make it. <coughs> um, okay, so I'm going to move on with the agenda here. Uh, we could get approval of last minutes, uh, last meeting, meetings, minutes, if I get a motion and a second. Motion to approve last minutes from the last meetings. Bruce Popham, move by the second. Uh, Rob Harris, second. Any uh, discussion or comments, revisions on the minutes from the last meeting? You had a chance to review them and they've kind of been gone over. Nancy, is she here, Nancy Dearsey? No. She does an awesome job on putting that together. I don't know who else is involved in it, but she does a great job. All right, so uh, any opposition to approving the minutes? None noted. Approved. Uh, any changes or uh, modifications to the agenda as written? Anybody have anything special that needs to happen? None noted, we'll move on. Uh, comments from me, I don't really have a lot. I'd like to charge in. Uh, I was actually going through junk in my office uh, <coughs> a couple weeks ago and I pulled out an old uh, minutes from a meeting in, I think it was in February of 2000. And I saw David Hotoff had been at the meeting and Don Kincaid and myself. Those are the only three that are left. Uh, Skip, you might have been around, but you weren't at that particular meeting. So it was interesting, and then um, who was the guy? H.T. Ponton, his uh, comments were there. <laughs> Anybody that, uh, you know, go way back. <laughs> this guy, H.T., used to get here and he'd rant and rave and, and complain about uh, the state sovereignty, submerged lands, and all this kind of stuff. And I remember the first meeting I went to, and, and I thought, well, isn't somebody going to answer him? <laughs> and so I, like, dove in. I was going to help him answer those questions and I realized he comes to every meeting and says the same thing and complains about it. It was one of those uh, learning experiences and the people that have been around, they rolled their eyes on memory. It's like, don't go there, don't go there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, if you look back on those old meetings and it's really interesting to see the, the names and you think of the, the faces that go to those names and just where it's all been. So, David, thank you for uh, 15 years. If I, and, and if, I, if Don was here, we'd all get a little pen, maybe, or a, a, a <coughs> pen that we could get for 15 years of good service. But uh, anyway, so that's my little thing. I just, you know, thanks for David for lots of service and, 
and Don, who's not here, will probably show it. So, Ben and a few other people, good, good to be here. It's a nice, fun drive in here, isn't it? Love the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a few little details. Uh, we're not going to be live on the internet today, I don't think, Clinton? Um, I we think. Are. We are? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're live, and if we're not live, then we're going to be taping the, the meeting. This is uh, thanks to Clinton Barris and FloridaKeys.com. So, with that in mind, when you're wanting to speak, and we'll try to get your hand raised, I'll try to acknowledge you. Mary will be giving you a live mic, so don't try pushing buttons, it will be live. And Mary is very good about that. So try to speak, uh, you know, in turn. I'll try to acknowledge you, and I'll try to, you know, I'll write names down if we have to. Let's try to keep it orderly and, and keep in mind that, you know, others that might want to watch this later would want to hear what we're saying. Um, if you have a cell phone, which everybody does, if you could turn it off or turn it on vibrate, and it would be uh, helpful and less disruptive. If you have a thing that anybody's phone goes off, they buy lunch, so <laughs> maybe not. We wish. Uh, don't really have much else. We are still uh, we're reviewing the applications for the empty sack seat, which is, uh, I think it's a lower keys fishing <coughs> alternate and I, I, we should have a, a person in that position by the June meeting. Um, we have only one public comment today and that will be in the afternoon at 2.45. If we have uh, any action items, I think we have two action items that we might be moving on. We'll take public comment before those action items, but otherwise we don't have a comment scheduled in the morning. So Don, you missed a little shout out. Uh -oh. <laughs> I was telling him that I was going through some old notes and going through the minutes of a meeting from, I think, February 2000. And you and David Hawthoff and myself were the only people left in the room that were on the sack at that moment. So thanks for 15 years and more of good service. And I said if we had little pens, we could give them out. Maybe we'd get a little clicky pen later for somebody. Anyway, thanks, Don. Um, so this morning we're really going to focus or, you know, in the beginning, we're going to jump right into it because I, I want to leave as much time for Dr. Jackson as possible. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit of an update on the draft environmental impact statement work that's being done by the sanctuary staff. And uh, then after that, we're going to spend a good bit of time listening and talking with uh, Dr. Jeremy Jackson, who we're very happy to have here. And I think it'll be a real uh, exciting and lively discussion that will follow. So without any further fussing around, I'd like to turn it over to Beth Devaney and she's going to talk about the uh, regulatory review process. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm glad everyone is sitting as close to the front of the um, audience seats as possible because the screen is a little bit small, so hopefully you can see this. Um, but with all of our uh, presentations and information, they are um, posted to the website after, so you can refer to these, this information on our website following the meeting. Uh, so I'm just going to give a brief update on where we have been uh, since the October Advisory Council meeting and what staff at the Florida Keys Na National Marine Sanctuary have been working on with our partner agencies at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So you have seen this slide many times. Uh, we've made some minor modifications to it to make it a little bit clearer about the process, where we are, and key steps in that process. And so this box that is outlined in yellow is where we are right now. And that is the development of potential alternatives that will be analyzed in the draft environmental impact statement. Where we have been this big box is where we spent about the last two years with the community working groups and the advisory council providing input and options for what would be analyzed in the draft environmental impact statement. And those are these documents that you've had at the previous meetings, June, August, and October. And these are those that information that is being looked at for the DEIS. These are not the DEIS. So following development of the draft environmental impact statement, there is public review before the agencies then develop a final environmental impact statement and updated regulations. 
So we still have a lot of work to do in this box, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. So here's, in words, the list of where we are. So the check mark is what we completed, and that's what the Advisory Council did in June, in August, and October. And where we are right now is NOAA with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is reviewing all that information and developing a range of alternatives that will be analyzed in the draft environmental impact statement. And the next steps, those uh, proposed alternatives will be released in the EIS. We will have it open for public and agency comment. Agencies will respond to those comments. And with those responses will be a final environmental impact statement and eventually revised rules and potential marine zones. So these are the steps and we are right there in that green box. So what happens in that green box is this. So staff are currently, as I've said before, taking all that information from what we gathered from you, what, was, what came in through the public scoping comments back in 2012, looking at all that and developing a range of regulatory and zoning alternatives. These will be analyzed in, uh, for economic and environmental impact and benefit. We are coordinating with the other state and federal agencies who have a role to play in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So, as a reminder, these are the nine priority issues that you identified back in December of 2012 to look at through this regulatory review process. So these are the issues that we've been working through with the community working groups, with the meetings we've been having over the past two years, and now we are developing the alternatives. This slide shows the two items that are underlined, artificial habitats and fishery management coordination. Those are more likely the programmatic and administrative uh, options and alternatives. This slide, a lot more is underlined. These priority items from the Advisory Council may have regulatory changes and options that will be looked at and analyzed. And those are, the, the first three are the marine zone items shallow water wildlife and habitat protection, coral reef ecosystem restoration, the ecosystem protection. Then we have permit procedures and adaptive management, boundary modifications potentially, personal watercraft tours and fishing conflicts, and water quality. Those are the items that may have a regulatory uh, option that will be analyzed. So now I'm going to talk through a little bit of what staff have been doing since October. And as a reminder, this, this slide shows the primary marine zone options that were put forward to the Advisory Council for review, and then the Advisory Council uh, forwarded to the agency for review. And those two working groups that had the, the most options for marine zone modifications were the Shallow Water Wildlife and Habitat Protection Working Group and the Ecosystem Protection Working Group. And all of their information is online for reference. But as a quick reminder, the uh, working group for the Shallow Water Wildlife Areas, their recommendations to the Advisory Council were to eliminate two zones. Those are areas that are no longer existing. They recommended status quo for seven of the existing wildlife management areas. They uh, recommended potential modifications for 19 of those areas. And those modifications could be a slight change in area that is uh, protected, slight change in the type of use. Um, those uses are usually idle speed, no wake, no motor, some no access buffer zone. And so looking at uh, what is needed to protect the resources in those areas. So modifying uh, 19. 
and then they identified 24 potential new areas that might need additional protections to protect the shallow water wildlife or habitat resources that are there. And again, the recommendations there are largely about how you can operate a vessel in those areas. So that is what the working group presented to the advisory council. When the advisory council reviewed that, they forwarded all of those recommendations on to the agency for analysis and review. In addition, the advisory council also added one new area for consideration, and that was primarily due to the bird resources in that area. The Ecosystem Protection Working Group, they looked at the sanctuary preservation areas, the special use areas, and the ecological reserves. And they did not look at every single zone, but of the existing areas that they looked at, they identified 11 that might need some modifications. They also looked at the sanctuary boundary and uh, looked at potential modifications of the boundary in the region of the Tortugas. They proposed potential seven new marine zones. And the advisory council, when the advisory council looked at what that working group did, they also added one area for analysis. And finally, that working group removed the exception for catch and relief, catch and release by trolling in the four spas where it already exists. Um, so all of these have been given, forwarded to the sanctuary staff for review and analysis. And staff are looking at all of these and what came in through the public scoping comments uh, and other input for feasibility, cost, uh, etc., and determining what the range of alternatives will be for analysis. And our first cut at doing that, you all should have a copy of the um, goals and principles of this management plan review, the goals and principles that you set out for yourselves for this review. And so staff's first categorization of all of these options and ideas are by those goals and objectives. So the key ones we've been looking at, reducing stressors. Uh, reducing stressors from human activities by establishing areas that restrict access to sensitive wildlife populations and habitats. Minimize conflicting and heavy concentrations of uses. Protecting large contiguous habitats. Facilitate research. And protect resources and allow use. So all of those options that have been uh, put forward, and there were well over 250 options, um, we've sort of been category, categorizing them by the goals of this review process. We have also been looking at the principles that you set forth for this review process and using that as a lens for initial analysis of all these ideas and options as well. And the main principles, recognizing that bordering and overlapping marine management regimes should be considered. And this applies to National Park Service areas, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service areas, state parks, state aquatic preserves. So looking at the whole management scheme for how uh, management will fit in and where the protections are needed. And specifically, I've added this um, asterisk point because one of the things we really are specifically looking at, particularly in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service areas, is is it compatible with National Wildlife Refuge purposes and wilderness designation? That was not part of your original principles, but that is something that we are looking at very closely. Another one of the principles was the use of temporal zoning and looking at how that may work in protecting the resources of the Florida Keys. Each habitat type should be represented in a non-extracted marine zone. We're also looking at how the options that came forward meet that principle. 
Uh, information on resilient reefs should be used in making decisions. And finally, the size, cumulative total area, and spatial relationship of the zones matter for how we reach the protection goals of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So that is where staff have been to date, is looking at everything that came in, these documents and the third one um, that I don't have here, all of the public scoping comments that came in, and everything you as an advisory council have been providing over the last two years is how do we now move it into a suite of alternatives that will then be analyzed um, for environmental and economic So with that, open for questions, discussions. Good morning, Beth. Good morning. Thank you very much for that presentation. Now, I've only got one question because of the fact that I know that the, the general public, uh, as well as many of us that were on those working groups, I particularly am interested because I know that there's a lot of folks that are still looking at those original charts and boxes and lines, everything that were drawn up that, that we as working groups pretty much, you know, did away with and, and started over from scratch. When will we see a updated version of what you just had up there put onto a chart so we can look at it and see it visually represented? That will be with the release of the draft environmental impact statement, which we're targeting for end of 2015. Um, at that point, we will have done, looked at what the alternatives are, and it will have the analysis in it. Um, so it'll be a much more useful tool for the public and the advisory council to use and respond to um, the options for changing management of the Florida Keys. Okay, thank you. Comments? Yeah, I mean, those original maps were just wild musings by some of the, you know, we've gone over this. This was, those were not intended to be uh, any representation of where we were going or just two or three people's ideas. So, you know, people got hung up on those maps and that was, you know, that's what they've fi been fixated on. And probably not going to look anything like that when we get it the draft environmental impact statement. With that in mind, I think, you know, Beth, you pointed out, you know, the, the stuff that they're forming, they're developing right now is based on <clears throat> input from our scoping meetings. So there's a lot of things that people from the public want to have done, input from the work groups that went through the SAC. So the work groups had a, a bite at it, the SAC had a bite at it, but then there's NOAA, there's Florida Fish and Wildlife, there's other agencies that are weighing in on this. So, you know, we may give them a recommendation, but that's guidance that's not written in stone. So what they, you know, they're gonna weigh other things when they come up with this, you know, with the range of alternatives. So, you know, I, I think they're gonna look seriously at what we've done, but, you know, don't, you know, don't get all upset <coughs> if they propose something that we didn't say, because, you know, that's, they're, they're getting input from a lot of sources to do this, we're just one source. I think we're important, but we're not the only source. So maybe Beth or Sean want to address that in a little bit. If yeah. do you want to think? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Kim. Uh, I mean, that's about right. I mean, it's, we're going to, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to kind of put all this together. There were a lot of recommendations. Um, there's a lot of coordination amongst agencies uh, that, that, that has to happen. But with every advisory council meeting, we're also going to be providing updates on our progress and seeing kind of how things develop. Um, so there's going to be report outs at every advisory council meeting as we kind of move along. But if folks want to see kind of what we're looking at, it, it, it's, uh, it is what the advisory council recommended we look at. Uh, and, and, that's, uh, and that's what was discussed at the June, August, and October meetings. Um, some of it was pretty broad, and, and some of it, you know, was multiple ideas on the same topic, and, and, and so we're sorting that out, and as Beth just described, but um, as we work through it all, we're going to continue to give uh, updates to the advisory council at each meeting, and, and, then, and then get it out as a draft for another round of uh, public review, 
as well as input from the advisory council. Um, that it will extend over a couple meetings so that there'll be lots of discussion, um, at least a three month comment period, that kind of stuff. And this is all before any regulations are proposed. And if I may, I recognize it's a lot of information and a lot has happened over the last two, two and a half years throughout this process. And so to facilitate greater um, access to that information, we're currently making some changes to, to our website um, so that this information and all of the information that's come out of the working groups, the public scoping comments, and the uh, decisions the advisory council made are sort of in, in one place, much easier um, access to be able to find and get that information. Um, so. <coughs> Any other comments? Questions? So Beth, you thought like the fall somewhere in there with the... <laughs> don't, don't hold her to that. No, we, 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 we're, we're, that's what we're aiming for still yeah. uh, with the schedule. Um, but uh, there's, there's, always, there's no unknowns involved. Uh, and, and there's a lot of review, a lot of coordination has to happen. Uh, sure. Well, get it right. <laughs> Uh, without any further comments, you know, we're ahead of schedule, but I think that's good. I'd like to, you know, have that extra time to to take a whack at Jeremy and listen to what he has to say too. <laughs> I got protection. No, no, we wanted to. We want to make sure that we have plenty of time for this. So, Sean, thanks. Um, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jackson. Uh, this was uh, something that Ken and I had talked about after an editorial, an op-ed piece that Dr. Jackson had written in the New York Times and thought it was appropriate to come uh, speak to the Sanctuary Advisory Council um, it, it, after he's released a pretty major body of work about status and trends in the Caribbean and in the communities. But uh, just a quick background on Dr. Jackson. He's a senior science Emeritus at Smithsonian Institution and Professor of Oceanography, uh, Emeritus at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He studies human impacts on oceans and the ecology and evolution of tropical seas. Uh, Dr. Jackson is the author of more than 175 scientific publications, including 10 books. Uh, he is a fellow of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Scientists has received numerous prizes and awards, including the International Prize in Ecology and Conservation, the Paleontological, Paleontological Medal, and the Darwin Medal of the International Society for Reef Studies. Jackson's work on the collapse of coastal ecosystems was chosen by Discover Magazine as the Outstanding Scientific Achievement of 2001. His most recent book is Shifting Baselines, uh, The Past and Future of Ocean Fisheries. Uh, and Dr. Jackson also sits on uh, NOAA's Scientific Advisory Board. And I should have gone with the long bio. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, well, I can get started. We'll, we'll and, get into and, here. Um, and hopefully we will. And actually, I'm going to show some photographs. And you're not going to see them in the way back of the room, so it's up to you. Yeah, where is it? Where's the 15 year old? <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Stick it in. Short cables. 
So while they're figuring this out, um, let me give you a little bit of background. I'm, I'm sure a number of people are thinking carpetbagger. Um, so I'd just like to say that I went to first grade in Miami Beach and second grade in South Miami. And I went to fifth to twelfth grade in Coconut Grove. And the first time I came to the Florida Keys was 1948. And I spent the entire 1950s sailing in the Florida Keys and Biscayne Bay. Uh, with my parents. My dad was an ex-sea captain, master mariner, before he became a, a historian of the Caribbean. And so I actually grew up uh, listening to stories of the Caribbean the way it had been since the first um, arrival of Columbus to the present. And that historical background that I've experienced, and you know we can put this on a Clip, and we can use your computer, and yep. yeah, maybe it'll work, and then you'll be happy. Um, I have um, seen with my own eyes um, an appalling degradation. Um, when I lived at the Floridian Hotel in 1948, ships were bringing in, fishing boats were coming in with 25 or 30 gigantic sawfishes dangling from the side of the boat that people killed for fun. The same with sharks, um, the same with trophy fish, <coughs> and et cetera. Uh, I never uh, scuba dived when I was a kid, but I snorkeled. And the Florida Keys were wall-to-wall -wall forests of Acropora palmata. There were places where the palmata was so thick you had to be really good to be able to swim through them. And what you're looking at is the pale vestige ghost of what was the ecosystem of the Florida Keys. Now, I'm going to show you, when they figure this out, I'm going to show you a bunch of data uh, that come from this report um, that was published. And, and when we get the, the slides up on the, um, on the on the screen, you'll see the URL for this, so you can download it if you want. You can look at all the data. This is a 300-page book. It contains about 85% of all the data that were ever collected about the wider Caribbean from 1965 to present. There are more than 35,000 quantitative surveys of data, and these data were collected by the scientific community writ large, as well as government agencies of 33 different countries. This is as much as we're <coughs> ever going to know about the history of the Caribbean reef ecosystem and how it came to be the way it is today. And so what I'm going to assert as I go through this talk is that this is the scientific knowledge. And this is what any management organization needs to look at in thinking about how to move forward. And that's not true just here. You have it on a stick, just stick it in your computer. Okay, and, and um, it's not just here. The government of Curacao is doing this. The government of Bonaire is doing this. The government of Belize is doing this. The government of Cuba is doing this. The Bahamas is doing this. Everywhere is doing it because the general perception is that, as it comes from this, that the situation of coral reefs in the entire tropical Western Atlantic is very bad. Okay, and if we can get that up there, I can go through. Okay, and water. Yeah. 
PC fight. Is what no, it's doing. not. It no, it's not. It works on every projector anywhere, even in the U.S. government. This works in Silver Spring. So I don't know why it doesn't work here. Someday the government will grow up and realize that Macs are about 10,000 times superior. <laughs> That's why Hollywood uses them exclusively and most businesses yeah, I know. But, oh, it is a conspiracy, of course. But they make movies, right? <laughs> okay, now, how are you going to get it on the screen? I guess you're going to go closer. Is that okay? Okay, now this is going to be real dorky. I mean, it won't reach, will it? Is there a remote? There is. <laughs> Let's hope it works. If it does not work because my computer, just give me a nod. Okay, well, I'm pressing advance and it's not okay. going. So somebody's going to have to sit there. Okay, so Carl reefs are in trouble everywhere. It's not just here. Um, and, and they're in trouble because of us. Nobody doubts that. I mean, it's just the way it is. And, and if we're going to fix this, if we're going to think about it, if we're going to make reefs more resilient to this climate change thing which is coming, uh, then we're going to have to uh, understand how we got there, which is why this report was essential, and, and, and from that determine you know, when, how, and why everything went bad, and then develop management, do what you people are trying to do here, develop actions that can somehow or another compensate for that. Okay, next. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through in detail this report, then I'm gonna very briefly say that everything we found in the Caribbean is being found in Australia and the Coral Triangle and the Central Pacific. This is not some weird Caribbean thing. Uh, and then I'm gonna discuss the things that we gotta do, if it's gonna be any better, and put the and then in the end, I made two very perverted slides, and I'm really guys, glad he's here uh, this morning in bed about what I think you all have to do from a scientific perspective. Next, okay, and that's the cover of the report, and you can get the whole damn thing at www.icreform.org/c/caribbean-report. It's all there. The data in the book, everything is there. Next. Okay, so let's think about the Caribbean background. You know, I used to live in Panama. When I first went to Panama in 1968, it was 80%, 90% forested. Now it's 10% forested. Most of what used to be forest is burned out by slash and burn agriculture. And there's a bunch of grass and weeds. All the big animals are gone and you've got little rats and rodents and stuff running around in the ground. And coral reefs are the equivalent condition today. We've lost all the big vertebrates. The whales are gone. You know there used to be abundant whales in the Caribbean. There were abundant sharks. We've got less than 1% of the sharks you used to have. There were huge tuna. There were huge groupers. There were huge, all of these things. They're gone. And, and in place, we've got you know what we've got. We're also really freaked out about climate change, and we're so freaked out about climate change that we're ignoring everything else. And the irony of that is that, in fact, uh, I'm going to show you that the climate change effect so far has been trivial in comparison to the consequences of overfishing, too many tourists, and etc. And uh, and so what we did, the whole purpose of this study, which cost about a million bucks and took three years. And we got the data from about 250 people and et cetera, was to evaluate whether or not this perception of the way coral reefs are uh, is correct or not. Next. So let's do a little bit of history um, close to home. This is total commercial fish catch in Cuba, Florida, and the Bahamas from 1840 to the present. We got great boats, it peaked, it crashed, it was crashed by 1960, and it has never recovered. You are looking at the dread of fish populations commercially. And not only that, and these are the great pictures that my student Lauren McClenahan found in the archives here. I love them. Uh, same boats, they, boats, they replaced the boats, but same kind of boats, same dock, same pier. In the 1950s, when people paid a bunch of money to drink beer and catch fish, the trophy fish was always 
a Goliath grouper that weighed at least 175 pounds. Today, these are the biggest fish they catch. People can argue all they want. Florida Fish and Game can say everything they want. But this is what people used to catch. This is what people catch today. That's the fact. There are daily photographs for those 50 years. It's amazing. OK, next slide. This is what the northern Florida Keys used to look like. This is what it looks like today. This is what Discovery Bay, Jamaica, where I cut my career, used to look like. This is what it looks like today. The Florida Keys are as bad <coughs> as Jamaica. Next slide. OK, so we did a lot of work. We went to all these places virtually for the data. Every black, black dot represents the location in the database. The big yellow dots represent the 21 places for which we have really cool data going back to the 1970s. So those are the places where we have trajectories of change. And those places are the ones that are really important for inferring cause and effect of why we're in this condition. And you can see there's 34 countries, 90 locations, 287 data sets from 78 investigators, 35,577 quantitative surveys. This is more data than exists for the Great Barrier Reef from the beginning of research in Great Barrier Reef. This is the largest quantitative coral reef data set in the world. Next slide. OK, so now let's look at raw data. No models, no smoke and mirrors, just the simple data on the changes that have happened in corals, in seaweed, in sea urchins, and bleaching events since the beginning. Next slide. OK, now I'm going to spend a little time on this. So this is what coral cover was like in the 1970s. Not as high as people used to claim, somewhere in the 50s percent, 40s to 50s percent. You can see the little black dots represent every data point. There's a huge amount of scatter. But it's pretty clear what the mean is doing. It's going down, down, down. And then it hasn't really done anything since 1990. Now, this is for the entire Caribbean, OK? And, and I mean, this is just waiting for Godot, you know? It's just flat. But the most important thing in this graph is look at all these points up here. Where are these places with all the abundant coral? And what's special about those places that have so much coral? OK. And then, of course, there are places which are dead, places that have 0% coral, 1% coral, 2% coral that used to have a lot. Where are those places? OK. This is the explosion of seaweed. That, and this line is when the sea urchin diademic antelarum died, right? Somewhere between 95 and 99 plus percent of all of the black signs of sea urchin that a lot of us used to love to hit with our hammers when we got stabbed, uh, got sick, and died throughout the Caribbean. This is a key event in the history of the Caribbean. Uh, and you can see that. Uh, what's really interesting, though, is the coral was already going down, down, down. But this just hastened the process. And what it did set off, unquestionably, is an explosion of seaweed, slime, OK? And this is the beginning of the covering of the reefs of the Caribbean by seaweed that didn't used to be there before. Sylvia Earle has a wonderful quote from her tech-type dive, you know, when the five bathing beauties got in the thing and swam around, and she became famous. And, but she was a serious scientist. She had a PhD in psychology. And she um, published a tech-type report. And at the beginning of the tech-type report, it says, it's really curious that given all the profusion of animal life on coral reefs, there's no plants. And that she had to really work hard to find seaweed. Well, think about today. That's a metric of the change. This is the death of the diadema. There are a few places where they've come back. That's interesting. But the, the, the Caribbean mean is zero still. And this is bleaching events. Now remember, this is just all the data. This is not a model. And notice that it was pretty much over by the time bleaching happened. OK, next slide. So just the data. This is an opinion. This is just the data. 
The overall decline in the Caribbean began in the 70s and was pretty much stabilized by 1990. The massive shift in corals and seaweed abundance closely followed the demise of diadema. But corals were already declining at least a decade before, and that was due to coral disease and, and the advent of cheap nitrogen fertilizer, almost certainly, but nobody recorded that. And these major changes in composition long preceded any impact to climate change. You cannot blame climate change for the collapse of corals <coughs> in the Caribbean Sea. Next. Okay. But there was all that variability in the data, right? I mean, there were some places with 60% living coral today, other places with only zero. So where are those good places and where are the bad places? Next slide. Well, you are one of the really bad places. Um, so the way we just group by eye. These are the 21 places that data that go all the way back to the 1970s. A whole bunch of places had lots of high coral cover, they tanked after the diadema died, and they never recovered. Hockey stick. Then are the other places that have just been going down, 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 sort of continuously. And then there are the places that didn't read the script. Places that haven't changed that much between the 1970s and today. And so the question is, how come? This is what we want to understand, right? We want to be like that. And all the places where we don't have a lot of coral, we want to be one of these places. Look at that. That's the flower garden banks. 55, 60% live coral cover in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and in the 2010s. What do you think they're doing there, which is sort of different? Uh, that's Bermuda. You're going to see what Bermuda does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then there are even places like Barbados that they don't have a lot of coral, but they didn't get worse. And even that's sort of interesting in terms of why that should be. Okay. The other thing about this slide, and, and they're scattered all over the map. This is not oceanography. There's an outstanding paper by a Venezuelan woman named Ileana Cholet, published in Limnology and Oceanography, which is arguably the most exigent and demanding journal in the field, and she has characterized the physical and chemistry, chemical oceanography of the entire Caribbean, and there is no relationship between the patterns of change on, on the reefs and the physical or chemical oceanography. What that means is we're responsible. What that means is that the local differences in coral cover are due to what we do because they are not due to oceanography. And that includes hurricanes. Next. Okay, so what we want to know is how come, right? What were the major things that we as people were doing that are responsible for the decline of corals and coral reefs? And in doing that, we have to, we have to make a very important distinction between the actual drivers and the symptoms. Okay, next slide. So what are the drivers? What are people doing? We're overfishing. We're introducing species. I mean, Florida introduced, you know, that little lionfish, which is now this big. And if it, Florida didn't do it, North Carolina did it, but somebody introduced it. It didn't fly. Uh, introduced species, yeah. Greenhouse gas emissions, that's why the oceans get warm. That's why corals bleach coastal development and runoff, and human population increase in tourism. You'll read papers saying, oh, coral bleaching killed the corals. No. Warming, because we drive too many cars, and we make too much electricity, and we put too much CO2 in the atmosphere, makes the ocean warm, which causes coral bleaching. Coral bleaching, God didn't invent coral bleaching. We invented coral bleaching. Outbreaks of disease <coughs> are a consequence of human activity. The rise of seaweed is a consequence of human activity. The decline in coral recruitment and growth is a consequence of human activity. And the failure to recover after hurricanes. Hurricanes have been on Earth for three billion years. And they didn't matter. Coral reefs have been on the Earth for 450 million years. Hurricanes didn't matter. Hurricanes didn't matter in the Pleistocene a million years ago. Hurricanes have only started to matter 
in the last couple of hundred years. And then it collapsed the framework. Next. Okay, so I'm going to go through these things for which there's data. And, and, and deference to some people, you know, there's no data for African dust and all that stuff. But, but this is what 99.9% .9 of all scientists will say are the things we got to worry about. Okay, so pathogens, warming, too many people or not, coastal pollution, overfishing. There's a huge conflict in the literature about what is the most important thing. So, you know, I study overfishing. <clears throat> so I do a study where I only look at fishing and I ignore everything else. Well, gee, if I don't study it, I can't discover it, right? And that's what all the scientific papers are. That's why we did this study, to look at all the different factors at the same time. Virtually all studies are on a single factor. And the next slide is just some next, yeah, e examples of headlines, you know? It's overfishing. It's climate, slippery slope to slime, nutrients, you name it. Every one of those papers, it's, I will say with some pride, this one, which I wrote, is only about one thing. Next slide. Okay, there's um, the whole thing of Carl disease. Carl disease is, is really badly studied. We use terms like white band disease and yellow band disease. I mean, you get kicked out of the academy if you use terms like that for human disease or for cattle disease or whatever, but we're still sort of in the uh, sometime before the birth of Christ. Um, but the, the, but there, there's something you have to understand about the Caribbean. The Caribbean was dealt a bad deck. And that's because the Caribbean has been isolated from the global tropics for three to five million years by the rise of the Isthmus of Panama. What that means is that all the species that live in the Caribbean have never seen, seen in a scientific sense, uh, corals in say Hawaii or, or Tahiti or Australia or something. So they've been isolated. The first outbreaks of disease in the Caribbean happened when shipping exploded. The hundred fold increase in the volume of shipping read ballast water discharge. Uh, the diadema disease was first observed by my colleague Harris Lesios at the mouth of the Panama Canal. Um, and what's really interesting is that there are no reports anywhere in the Indo-West Pacific of a disease virtually eliminating a species of coral or a species of sea urchin. We got a problem in the Caribbean. We're vulnerable. We're like the poor people who lived here before Columbus came and gave them mumps, measles, and chicken pox. And as a result, 99% of all Native American people died within a period of about 150 years because of the diseases that we're immune to. And it looks like that's the same thing that's happening with Carl's. And there's nothing any of us can do about that. It's just a reality. Next. Oh, and, and lionfish. You know, this, we did this, and the reason they're so damn abundant and doing it so well is because there's nothing that can cope with them because of this isolation. Next. Okay, these are all the data. I want to talk about this a little. So there have been three really bad heating events in the Caribbean. 1998, 2005, and 2010. We have so much data that we can look at places and say, what was Carl covered two years before the big event? What was it afterwards? So you can take before minus afterwards divided by before, and that gives you a proportional change in Carl cover. If it went down, you'd say, gee, it was affected by the heat. If it went up, you'd say, well, that's weird. Okay, well, here are all the data for all three events. And what you can see, first of all, is that there is no significant change. No significant change, okay? Second of all, there are places that had 10, 15 degree heating weeks during those events that increased by 50% in coral cover. And there are places that of course crashed, but there are places that crashed that didn't have a lot of heat, places that increased that didn't. So the message of this is, and this doesn't say heating is good, but it just says that in the grand scheme of things, you can't see an effect. Some places, like in the Virgin Islands, very clearly heating had a major negative effect uh, but that's because they're covered with seaweed, which we'll get to in a minute. Next. 
Okay, people. This is one you're going to have to, you're not going to like this slide, but it's data, okay? This is Carl Cutter, pretty much today. This is the density, the number of people who live per square kilometer in different places. This is the number of visitors per square kilometer per year. Okay? So this is the median coral cover for the Caribbean. This is the median number of residents. Okay, so to the left, that's fewer than the average number of people living or fewer than the average number of tourists visiting. To the right is more than the average. Above is, you know, greater than average coral cover. Below is less than average coral cover. You're here. You're not quite so bad in terms of number of residents. There are a lot of places that, and, and these points represent upper, middle, lower keys, okay? Um, but look at Bermuda. Bermuda's got incredible high population density. They're rich. I mean, but they do only have one car by law, and a whole lot of other things we'll talk about in a minute. But they are the only one in the upper right-hand quadrant. They are the only place that has managed to combine lots of permanent residents with high coral cover. Now let's look at tourism. Okay. Um, there's Bermuda, hanging in there, really good. Lots of things are important besides the number of people. That's why you see all the scattered here. But look where you are. So, I mean, and this is St. Thomas, which is the ultimate absurdity. It has nearly 30,000 visitors per square kilometer per year. One of those ships, well, three of those ships, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You're working on it, but you haven't quite gotten there. Um, and, 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 uh, but there it is, okay? You have too many tourists, period. You may not like that, but the science says you have way too many tourists. Next slide. Okay, water quality. Um, water quality measurements are like oil spills. I, I conducted the oil spill study in Bahia Las Minas in Panama, where one third the volume of the Exxon Valdez was dumped on the reefs the Smithsonian had been studying for 40 years. So we had before <laughs> data. And so we did this big, huge study. Minerals management did not want me to study the biology. They just wanted me to study the oil, because if you're only looking at oil and you don't study biology, there's no biological effects, right? We studied the biology, and the reason you don't have drilling on the west coast of Florida is because of our study in Panama, which resulted in the National Academy declaring that you cannot have offshore drilling on your west coast. Okay. <laughs> It's the same with water quality. People have not been consistently measuring it until recently, and the Keys does it great now. I want to know the measurements in 1980, right? When I was here, the tourist brochure said, see the crystal clear blue waters of the Keys. Now they say, see the crystal clear green waters of the Keys. I think blue to green is telling you something. This is um, Bailey's Ferry <coughs> Reef. Uh, near shore and offshore, dramatic decline in transparency of the water. Same in western Puerto Rico. More shorter term data runs all over the Caribbean are showing the same thing. It's really scary. And this is almost certainly nitrogen. Farmers are using a thousand times more nitrogen than they need. And where does it go? It goes to the ocean, which is the sewer of humanity. Next slide. Okay, now overfishing of herbivores, this is a little complicated. Um, nobody, you can't just count fish. You have to know how big they are and you have to calculate biomass. Because 1,000 small parrotfish does not equal one big parrotfish in terms of its impact, good or bad, on the reef. And it's hard to count and measure size and transfer to biomass, so it took a long time for people to do it. So there were no old data, and because of that, people just threw up their hands. But um, when we all got together, I mean, all these amazing sort of rock star ecologists of Caribbean coral reefs for, for the last 40 years, somebody pointed out, you know, there's all this experimental work that shows that the sea urchin and parrotfish were negatively correlated with each other. So in places where there were a lot of sea urchins, there were no parrotfish. 
In places where there are a lot of parrotfish, there were almost no sea urchins. And then a guy named Marquet and somebody named Steve Carpenter said, well, that's a hypothesis, let's prove it. So they did experiments, a series of experiments, and every experiment demonstrated that diadema was inversely proportional in occurrence to parrotfish. So that means we can use the density of the sea urchin in the past as a proxy for the abundance of parrotfish. Okay, next slide. And so there were 17 locations, those places for which we've got lots of data through the whole time series and diadema data. They're the places with very low abundance of diadema. These are the less fish places. And the Florida Upper Keys was one of those places. In 1983, the Florida Upper Keys was in good shape, at least with regard to fishing. But diadema was very rare. We're going to see what happened afterwards. And then there are the overfish places, which are mostly the poor countries, except for the grotesque embarrassment of the U.S. Virgin Islands, which maybe is the champion of absurdity. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here are data. What you're looking at is coral cover today. Okay? No, you're looking at coral cover through time. And these are the places where, that weren't overfished in the 1970s. And on the right are the places that were overfished in the 1970s. And this is the trend line for all the surveys of coral cover ever done for those places distinguished solely on the basis of whether they were overfished way back when or not. What you see for the places that were not overfished way back when is that the coral cover, this black line, which is a regression line, and it's highly statistically significantly different from this line, which is much lower at the early overfish places. But the other thing you see, which I think is really interesting, is what people did in the 1970s is only part of the story. So the Florida Keys were up here in the 1970s and 80s, but you, you just trashed them. And so you're down here now. But look at all these places that are up here. The places that didn't overfish in the 1970s and 80s and kept on not overfishing. They're up there. Okay, next slide. Okay, now how come? Why is overfishing bad? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's very simple. Parrotfish are the goats of coral reefs. And, you know, all you have to do is go to the Galapagos and see the islands with goats. And then the Park Service came in with helicopters and AK-47s and Judas goats, and they killed every goddamn goat on an island. And as a result, it got green. Isn't it amazing? You kill the goats, it gets green. So macroalgae were rare on Caribbean reefs before 1983 because we had two kinds of goats, parrotfish and the sea urchin diadema. Then the diadema got sick and died. The places that were not overfished the parrotfish took up the slack. The places that were overfished looked like they needed a shave in a week. I was in Jamaica when it happened. The diadema died seven days later. There was a green fuzz covering the reefs of Jamaica. It was amazing. Terry Hughes ran around and surveyed them all and documented what happened. Okay. Uh, and the experiments, and experiments show, and this is what you really have to worry about. I mean, this is the new science, which is, in, is really relevant. Macroalgae reduce coral recruitment. They reduce coral growth rate. Uh, they sometimes smother and kill corals directly. And they also cause disease. And there's evidence, experimental evidence, that corals that are surrounded by lots of seaweed are more likely to bleach and more likely to die of disease afterwards. <clears throat> Okay, next slide. Okay, now these are all univariate analyses. I got a lot of pushback. I got a year of pushback. Uh, some of the people who push back are probably your friends. Because the epicenter of pushback was Florida. Okay, so, well, maybe. <laughs> so anyway, Billy always keeps me straight. Okay, so, what we did, and this is new, this is not in the report, is we did a multivariate analysis. 
It took months to figure out how to do it. You know, the data are garbage, they're sloppy, they're, they're collect, they're after the fact, you're trying to put square pegs in round holes. But I consulted like the rock stars of this kind of statistics. And so we did a multivariate analysis with fishing, hurricanes, because people still believe in hurricanes, uh, degree heating weeks, and human population density. And this is just the people who live there. This doesn't even include tourism, which would make it stronger. It's hard to compare the two kinds of numbers. OK, and here's the results. Uh, what you're looking at is a very abstract thing. And we don't have time to go through it. Just take it on faith. Question me afterwards. What we're looking at is the magnitude of the effect of fishing or numbers of people or hurricanes or heating in relation to everything else for those 17 places for which we have killer data. And what you see is pretty much nothing was important in the first time interval up until the diadema died. Because, you know, uh, if places that were overfished had diadema and vice versa, the only factor that's important is human population density is trivial. I, I would ascribe no significance to it. But after the diadema died, all hell breaks loose. And what you see is that fishing then becomes the driver of reef decline, along with human population density in the third interval. Hurricanes were never important in the analysis. And we get this bizarre, anomalous result that says warming is good for corals, which is obviously not true. OK, so why is that? Next slide. Very simple. It turns out that the places that were roasted more than anywhere else are Bermuda and the Flower Garden Banks. OK, they had the most heating by a factor of two of any of those, of those 17 reef sites locations. But hey, the corals survived. How come? Well, it's a hypothesis, but the reason they survived is because fishing is pretty damn restricted and is far away. Nobody's figured out how to build a hotel out there yet on an old oil platform, but I saw a proposal which just really made me laugh. Uh, and, and you know, development is very strictly regulated in Bermuda. Only one car, only one house. Only a certain size. Da 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 da. Okay, U.S. Virgin Islands experienced the next highest, about half of what that experienced, and 50% of the corals died. And to give you an idea how bad it was, in St. John, that meant they went from 10% live coral to 5% live coral. Okay, and uh, but what what about them? Well, St. John has 40% algal carpet where Sylvia Earle dove in Tektite, you've all seen those pictures, it's green. There are almost no living corals there. Okay, and tourism is uncontrolled, and development is uncontrolled, and whatever. And then Bonaire, which is another tiny little island, sitting down there in the southern Caribbean, had almost as much warming as the U.S. Virgin Islands, and coral cover in Crete. But hey, they don't have a lot of development, and they protect their reef. Next slide. OK, so let's summarize all that data. There's been a 50% overall decline in coral cover on Caribbean reefs since 1970. That's a fact, right? And a 5 to 10-fold increase in seaweed. That's a fact. Those, that's just data. The main causes of all that were first diseases in the 70s and 80s. White band disease wiped out a crop growth throughout the Caribbean. We have no idea why. We postulate it's because it was introduced through the canal. We know there was an explosion of shipping then, but you can't prove that. We do know that white band disease exists in the Indo-West Pacific and that you don't have mass mortality of a crop growth. So it's a reasonable hypothesis, but that's all it is. But after that mass mortality of the acropora, in the uh, 80s, we have the clear evidence for the importance of overfishing and too many people. Rising temperatures are just not part of that story. They do kill corals in limited places. They may kill everything sometime in the future, but they haven't done it yet. 
And the places that have suffered extremely from these big heating events are places that are badly overfished and look like garbage in the first place. Macroalgae kill corals. Macroalgae cause coral diseases. Um, and, and, um, and, and maybe, and you know, it, it, th there are about 15 papers, experimental papers, published in Science, Nature, and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences demonstrating this. Those are the leading scientific journals in the world. There are no experimental counterexamples in the entire literature. Okay. And macroalgae are an overfishing and a nutrient pollution problem. Sort of interesting before I get to the next slide because I would guess, I mean, I don't think anybody knows, but I would guess your problem is at least as much nutrients as it is overfishing because although you have a lot of seaweed, you don't have anything like St. John, for example. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is not unique to the Caribbean. Um, warming does cause, ex you know, extreme heating events do cause bleaching and stuff in the Pacific. In fact, it appears to be much worse in the Pacific. Uh, but there are also all sorts of studies that show too many people overfishing in coastal runoff are just as bad a problem there as here. But reefs that are protected in the end of West Pacific look great. And the reefs that aren't look crappy. You know, the inshore reefs of the Great Barrier Reef look just as bad as large areas of Flower Keys. I mean, and this is a huge scandal. They may lose their world heritage status this year because of the fact that they are doing nothing to control sugarcane agriculture and coal mining on the mainland of Queensland. Okay, next slide. You can see it in pictures. This is a wonderful trip I went on. Uh, and, and, and actually, Sean told me, these pictures are why the, the, the monument status was extended to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and whatever. This is a reef in the sense, so here's Honolulu. Here's Honolulu, here's the southern, the northern line islands. Is there a reef with no people? Is there a reef with 10 people, 2,000 people, 6,000 people? No agriculture, no nutrient pollution, no nothing, nothing but fishing, lots of fish, beautiful healthy corals, and pink. Pink is good, that's Crestos coral and algae. If you don't have pink, then coral babies won't settle. Pink is essential for coral survival. Palmyra that Gordon Moore bought for 15 million bucks so we could bonefish. Um, looks really good, and they're keeping it that way. Still pink, Tabaran, and Christmas Island. Okay, I could show you the data. You don't need the data. Next slide. And my wife, who is younger than me and more macho than I am, went on this amazing Southern Line Island cruise um, for, God, five weeks. Uh, diving about eight hours a day, and every place they went in the southern islands looked like this. 80, 85 percent, 95 percent living coral. A lot of fish. They had extreme heating. They looked great. They didn't read the script. Okay. Next. Okay, so I'm going to be next to this guy. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so what are the conservation implications for Caribbean rings? Um, you could do a lot. That's what my op-ed was about, right? And the way I like to give Billy a hard time is I'll say I had a line in the op-ed to do rigorous scientific monitoring and work to understand what's going on without enacting the laws and taking the action to protect it is the equivalent of a doctor who carefully monitors the decline of a patient until she dies without doing anything to save her life. <laughs> so you could do a lot. Climate change has distracted everybody and it's an excuse for doing nothing. If it's all climate change, I don't have to tell people they can't fish. If it's all climate change, I don't have to put a cap on the number of tourists 
or those absurd ships out there. I don't have to do that because, you know, it's all climate change, so let's have a party until it's all over. Bermuda, the flower garden banks, Bonaire, Curacao are examples of places that have done and are continuing to do it right. When they discover a new spawning aggregation in Bermuda, it is immediately off limits forever. No fisherman can go near any spawning aggregation. It's illegal. Okay. And, and yeah, go on next. Okay, so I put it in the context of Florida. <clears throat> you are the worst case scenario. The data say it. Okay, the data say it. You have far more people, far more tourism, far too little coral, far too little fish, etc. And you're just on a train to disaster. I mean, five million people plus in Miami use you as the backyard. That's the real population density of the Florida Keys. Um, and you have, by the standards of other countries, by the standards of Cuba, you have inadequate governance and regulation in both the water and on the land. You just do. And what you're doing is you're critically endangering the survival of the entire ecosystem. And the science is clear. I mean, I've read all sorts of reports about how fishing in Florida is sustainable, and I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Because all the science says that's not true, except the government science, state government science. OK, and if you don't do something now, <clears throat> you're going to be the ha handmaidens of the disaster. So, so what do I think you ought to do? You're going to laugh at me. You're going to say it's absurd. You're going to say it's absolutely impossible. Jeremy, you don't understand. People's lives depend on it, and on and on and on. But the problem is it's just the truth, OK? Next slide. You need to declare one third of the entire reef tract off limits for anything. And you have to do it now. <coughs> California is moving towards that. They started with 15%. They got really good results. They're moving to 20%. Fish are coming back. The ecosystem on the Florida coast looks really good. Okay? Bonaire is doing it. It looks really good. The flower gardens, the corals aren't so good. Not the flower gardens, the, the, the gardens of the queen. The corals aren't so good. They got really hit by disease and all the rest of it. But the fish are fantastic. And there's evidence for crew. I, I'm skeptical, so I'm going there in a few weeks to see. Um, it's just, but this is what they're doing in Europe now. There are all these terrestrial parks where nobody can even enter. The scientists cannot go in. It works. It's amazing. There's more birds. There's more big cats. There's more wolves. There's all that stuff. You have to absolutely protect everywhere all grazing fishes. It should, you know, it should be a crime to take a grazing fish. And you can say, well, we don't because we don't have traps and whatever. But you have spear fishing, and you've got such a huge illegal <laughs> fishing problem in the fire keys, it's ridiculous. And people are taking power. Uh, and you have to just yeah. make, and you have to make, I could show you pictures. And, and, and you've got to make all spawning aggregations off limits. You just have to. OK, you have to curtail all development. You have too much. And you have to cap the number of visitors and cruise ships to be much lower than today. I took my wife for her 65th birthday to the Antarctic Peninsula on a vacation. Broke the bank. We went deliberately on the smallest cruise ship that goes there, the Ushuaia, that can take 83 or 84 passengers. That made the Drake Passage twice as rough we had, coming back, we had 50-foot seas and 60-knot winds. I don't get seasick. My wife takes a lot of Dramamine, but it was puke city on that boat. <laughs> but we got to go ashore on every landing because we were on the small boat. Because by international convention, no more than 100 visitors can land at any site in Antarctica in a given day. And that's how they protect it. Okay, next slide. Okay, that's it. 
Uh, more than 200 people gave me the information. Um, and you can find it at that site, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So this was music to some people's ears and terror to other people's ears. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure all those people are in the room. Um, I, just open it up to the sack for questions and comments. I want to give everybody a chance. I don't want to just focus on one aspect of it. There's actually a lot of meat in this and a lot of uh, things that were said. So let's you know move around the room. Let's not try to get too bottlenecked in one area. So who has first crack at it? Oh, why am I not surprised? <laughs> and then we'll end the diadema discussion. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Jackson. That was one of the most succinct, cogent, and informative presentations that I have heard on this subject. And uh, in, I don't need to question anything that you have uh, come up with, but I, I just want to add a comment in that uh, I've been working for about eight years along with Dave Vaughn and Moat Marine Laboratory on the culture of diadema because we feel that it would be very important to be able to have a hatchery base for reef competent diadema to do experimental work with uh, uh, restoring coral reefs by restoring the function of remembering. And just this one thing that I want to, that I want to mention, and, and that's that up until about 2012, we had very good success with developing the, the culture technology for diadema. We were able to get them through to juveniles. Dave and his large tanks at the Moat <coughs> Laboratory was producing thousands of them. And that changed in the summer of 2012. Suddenly, my work in Lower Matacombe and Dave's work in Summerlin Key, uh, all of the, we had great success in growing the diadema larvae through to the point of rudiment formation about day 24, 25. Uh, the rudiment, uh, for those of you that don't know, is the juvenile, uh, the, the juvenile of the diadema that begins to grow within the larvae and develops to competency uh, for, for settlement. And uh, at that time, there's a lot of hormonal activity that takes place uh, within the larvae. And suddenly, in both locations, we could grow the larvae, but the larvae would not develop the rudiment. And that is the situation today. And we've gone through all kinds of different rationales for and experiments, and nothing has worked yet in so, terms okay. of chemical filtration. And but the thing that, that comes to mind is that in nineteen in, in twenty ten we had the Gulf oil spill. And the the thing, you know, gushed oil for three months and put 17 million gallons of, of uh, raw petroleum into the Gulf of Mexico, and the thought occurred to me okay, that so, so possibly. Okay. I, I, I get it. Um, and you know, the people who study developmental biology, the best, well, some places would say they're just as good, but traditionally the best laboratory in all of the Americas for studying larvae <laughs> development was the Friday Harbor Laboratory in a uh, sort of outside part of Puget Sound and they have all non-toxic glass pipes for their seaweed and they do all those things and it's uh, well known that larvae are notoriously vulnerable. Your hypothesis could easily be correct. Um, you know, um, I deliberately stick to the things that I feel I can unambiguously demonstrate because I think that's enough. Um, it would be really great to have more diadema. I think you'd have a problem with... They're coming back in Jamaica. Actually, the thing that's really interesting, they're still coming back in Jamaica in a few places, which is really interesting. Maybe it's easier to come back where they don't have their predators. You know, it's sort of hard to get them to a point now that everything's so low that, I mean, getting more fish might actually, for an interval of time, be a problem. Pete Mumby did experiments on that. But uh, in 
just in Jamaica, where I spent 20 years of my life working, probably dove a thousand times at this particular site, the diadem are coming back, the sargassum is gone, and it's solid acropora pomata <coughs> this high off the ground. It's fabulous. Um, I, you know what I didn't say? I think this report is really good news. I mean, a lot of you out there are thinking, holy shit, you know. <laughs> uh, but it's good news because we can save Caribbean coral reefs if we take the action. Okay, somebody else. Dave <coughs> Vaughn. And then Dave I, I hate to uh, suggest this. Uh, I've heard you speak before. But I think you're preaching to the choir. Uh, I'd want to know how we can get a few people to hear this. Uh, Craig Cave, Tourist Development Council, the uh, hotel owners, the people that rent out part of their house or all of their house, uh, Andy Newman, who's a representative here of the Tourist Development Council, and fishermen like me. Uh, I was talking to a fisherman last, uh, last night. They caught 30 small dolphin. What the hell are you going to eat 30 small dolphin? Thank you. Okay, so I know there's divisions of opinion, and, and, and you know, I deliberately play the scientist's role. But uh, I have a paper impressed with this amazing former student of mine, Ayanna Johnson, who you may know of. She directs the Blue Halo program for the Wake Foundation. They did a pilot study in Barbuda, where working with the government of Barbuda, they uh, negotiated in a year process. It took them only one year, year and a half. They negotiated the complete protection of one third of all of Barbuda. Uh, with enforcement and weight bought them a boat, you know, with maybe a gun on it or something, and they're doing it. This paper by Ayana and me is the result of her surveys in Curacao and Bonaire for her PhD. It's one of the four things she did. She also did an economic assessment, and she also did work on the redesign of fish traps to see if you can make them less dangerous because unlike here, fish traps are still very common throughout the Caribbean. And that was a depressing study because parrotfish are fat, so there's no way you can make a trap that parrotfish can get out of that everything else can't get out of. But at any rate, these are the results of her surveys that are having a big effect on the government of Curacao right now. Um, because Ayana has just negotiated with the government of Curacao a deal which involves millions of bucks to work with the government to do the same thing in Curacao that they did in Barbuda. And remember that first photograph I showed you, the reefs of Curacao, they look beautiful in lots of places, but they don't look as good as they used to look, and they're very worried about it. Okay, so what the survey showed is you ask fishers, do you catch more or less fish than previous generations? You know, 90% say less. How has catch changed in the last 10 years? Much worse. Do you catch bigger or smaller fish than previous generations? Smaller. These people who say bigger are 20 years old. Everybody else, you know. The number of fishers has decreased by 75% because you can't make any money. You ask divers, divers are, you know, they've got rose-colored glasses. So you ask them, how would you rate the fish population? Oh man, it's abundant, right? And how would you rate the health of reefs here? They are very healthy to healthy. And has the health declined in some years? It's worse, but whatever. And then if you look at age and these things, it breaks down. You know, anybody who's been a professional diver in Venera here South for 20 years will tell you it's gone south. The kids who come in and go out, you know, smoking dope and whatever, they think it's just all wonderful. What these data show is an opportunity for management. Because the same people say, it's gotten worse generally, and we've got to do something about it. Now the fishermen blame it on sunscreen, 
and global climate change and you know offshore fishing they, so they have a realistic notion of the change these guys have a shifted baseline but these people know why it's degrading and these people can't admit it now these are stark you know these are really poor people these aren't the people with the 50-foot fiberglass boats burning a gallon of gasoline every two minutes these are people who are trying to survive so this is a wedge this is a window which is going to be used in this negotiating process to improve the management of curacao and bonaire curacao i mean they're only doing this officially with curacao but bonaire is watching remember bonaire is still part of the netherlands they have dutch law and and so they can with an iron fist they can do stuff and they're going to do it um so I would suggest that it would be a really cool idea if you folks did a survey where you did not ask the state and you did not ask NOAA, but you brought in an independent survey company to ask all the fishermen and the divers the same questions. And I'll make you a bet. You'd see the same thing. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I, I always appreciate people bringing the plight of uh, coral reefs and those ecosystems to light. However, um, I always have told people that uh, there's always the top 10 or 12 uh, reasons that it, all coral reef scientists say is, that, is their reasons for the decline, and they've always debated on that 10 or 12 reasons. Um, Having done work in the Caribbean and in Florida, um, I, I see some big differences of uh, kind of generalizing the Caribbean with Florida and Florida even with um, Bermuda and the uh, Florida uh, Garden, uh, Gardens Bank. And I'm not surprised that uh, Bermuda and, and uh, Gardens Bank actually improved by higher temperatures. but. Uh, or I'm not surprised that overfishing of parrotfish in the Caribbean has a big effect. But I think here in Florida, where we've protected our reef fish for <clears throat> many years and, and don't really eat or overfish parrotfish, uh, I've observed the reverse. Um, I think we are so swung the other way with parrotfish that I think our new recruitment is, is definitely jeopardized. I can hardly plant a coral out there without Dozens of parrotfish ready to eat something they haven't seen in a long time. So why don't you do an experiment? I've heard all this before. Why don't you guys do management experiments? And why don't you set up really large areas where you do that and find out the answer? I don't believe you. And the reason I don't believe you is because the data are virtually all the data. And they show something. I used to be in the Florida Keys. There were tons of parrotfish in the Florida Keys. And everything was fine. Now, if you're saying, the only way I can put coral on life support is to go out and get rid of the things that ought to be there. That might even be true in some small context, but the data speak for themselves. Your corals are dead. Your reefs look like crap. You don't have a lot of coral cover on them. They're much worse than all those other places. So given that, instead of looking for some reason to say why Florida is somehow special, from every other place in the world, why don't you do some experiments to actually deliberately in an adaptive management context test these things, controlled experiments, where you actually do the variables and you can prove me wrong. But I would say the weight of the evidence is overwhelmingly against you. And you know, you do have another problem. You have five million people on your back door that poop it. You didn't get rid of septic tanks down here until two years ago or something like that. You've got a reservoir of excess nitrogen in the honeycomb rock, which is the, the Florida reef track, which is going to leak nitrogen for the next 20 years. So yeah, you've got all these different problems, but if you really believe that you know this is somehow not the reason you need to do two things, one, you have to come up with an alternative hypothesis, and you have to test it. And if you're not willing to do those things, you don't deserve to sit at the table in the scientific discussion, because if you don't do those experiments, you guys are going to fail. Well, 
Thank you very much, Rob Harris. Yes, Rob Harris. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your presentation, although I am from the fishing community, so obviously I'm not going to agree with everything that you say. Uh, you, have, you have some valid points that I, I can say in my lifetime I've seen, and some that, that I question. Uh, of course, I always question science, and I'm thankful that science questions itself. Uh, That's a great line. You've practiced that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got one question for you, but in three parts. Okay. Uh, you know, you give all the, the examples and stuff of uh, the worldwide travels and, and show the pictures of the diversity of species and the abundant fish life. I, as a fisherman, because I saw this with the environmental work group, I see diversity and abundance of the fisheries or fish species differently than a scientist or a diver does. Can we can we do this one by one? Absolutely. So when you finish the first one, I'll respond and then. Okay. Okay. Uh, so when I, as a fisherman, I'm targeting uh, myself personally, mostly larger pelagic species. Uh, occasionally, I will come in and fish, fish the reef for you know your snapper group or muddies. Uh, never a parrot fish. Uh, but yeah, with, divers, cats with, the with divers, they tend to look at the abundance of, of fish species, and they're looking at the, the small fish, the little darters and stuff. So is there a way that you would propose being able to speak abundance of fish in terms that we can both agree on? Okay, so I think that's a good question, and let's, let's first just worry about a little technicality that from the point of view of an ecologist, it's not the abundance, but the biomass, and in particular, the numbers of large individuals, because of what I think I said earlier, that one parrotfish like this is the equivalent of thousands of little parrotfish. And, and, you know, and it's hard to do those kinds of surveys. Um, the offshore, the really big billfish and everything, they're really something I haven't addressed. I, I think it's interesting that the Billfish Association people have been talking about the need to cut way back in, in bill fishing because I've been in a lot of meetings when the, that group has been present because they express concern. But that's not the reef question, okay? Um, with regard to the, the snappers and the groupers and, and the jacks and whatever, um, I think everybody agrees that they're not as abundant as they used to be, and the question is whether you believe me or some other interpretation of that. I, I think there, there are two things that you do have to come to grips with. One of those amazing photographs of Lawrence, because they are a random sample of what people catch on a boat, you know, day in and day out, and there's that dramatic change. And there's another thing that, um, a study that she and a bunch of other people did, which was to, you know, the, the, the wonderful Carnegie lab that was at Dry Tortugas in the last century and early, early 20th century. Um, there were a lot of fish studies done, and although they were just taxonomic surveys, they list the relative abundance of things. Four of the most abundant fishes in the Dry Tortugas in those early 20th century surveys are on the endangered species. And if you also, if you look at menus, um, just from this region, and you look at the species that were on the menu 50 years ago or 40 years ago, and the species that are on the menu today, uh, and, and factoring the lies, you know, because if you do genetic analyses of, of the fish that are sold in restaurants today, you discover they're everything but the species they say. But even ignoring that, there's been a, a profound shift. Uh, I only said one-third because I think if you did one-third and you did and you had responsible regulations for fishing you could fish a lot I mean Florida is not the worst case scenario for fish there's no question about that and if you if you manage to and, and, and you know it's scale too I mean a person named Joan Rutherford <coughs> did fundamental work on this you can't have lots of little postage stamps you got to have really big chunks. That's what they decided on the Great Barrier Reef. And so I'll throw out a number. Uh, it just, it's, a, it's just a number. I mean, who knows what the best one is? 
But if you had a bunch of chunks of 10 miles by 10 miles, so they went all the way out to the outer barrier, and they were 10 miles on the seaward side and 10 miles on the bay side, and you scattered them along the Florida Keys, you'd get a very, very dramatic result. And you'd still be able to fish in two thirds of the Florida reef track. And God, that ought to be enough for anybody, right? Uh, well, you had other said, questions? Oops, say again? You had other questions already? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Uh, and having said that with the, the one-third closure, uh, the, the graphs that you put up that were representing the Florida Keys. Uh, what which, I think, which graphs? Mostly just the, where you, all the little scatter effects of tourism. And, oh, and yeah. Fishing, I, what, I, what I did, to be clear, was that I looked this morning at my data tables in the book and I found out where the points for upper, middle, and lower Florida Keys were on those graphs, and then I stuck a red FK next to them. Okay, um, that's all that is. Right, but that, that leads me to one of my questions. It was talking about the, the need or your recommendation to close one third uh, to make everything better. Those data sets, they were taken from the upper, middle, and lower keys. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I find when I'm dealing with the, the researchers and the, the fisheries biologists and even at the, the federal level is, there is very, very little data from Marquesa west out to the Dry Tortugas, with the exception of right around the Dry Tortugas. Would that not, because I, I fish out there a lot, uh, would that not also be the, the equivalent example of a one-third closure? Just I'm, of that, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm not going to answer that question because because I will admit to ignorance, and and you know corals are a lot more my specialty than fish anyway. Um, but that's something you all should discuss. I mean, <clears throat> so when Enrique Sala did a study of the Sea of Cortez, where it's similar stuff, right? He did he and a number of other people surveyed the entire. Oh, California. All along. They found spawning aggregations. They found this, that, and the other. And then they constructed a, a proposal for closures, for protection. And then, and then they said, but this is going to affect a couple of places that the fishermen are going to hate. So can we get pretty much the same result if we fidget it a little bit? And in one case they could, and in one case they couldn't. So the revised thing that they actually published went in the direction of trying to adjust everything to make the minimum number of people <coughs> unhappy. I mean, you can do that. There's even software for this. You can put in all the data, and you can do an analysis, and you can come up with a kind of a compromise that reflects the needs for conservation and the desires of the fishing community. And you can get a result. And I would say I would leave that to the experts here to make that decision. I mean, there I'd really be a carpet backer. I don't know. Um, and my final question, especially now that, that the guy with the gun has left the room, <laughs> is you, you noted know, you know the, 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 the you've seen as you travel, uh, the illegal fishing that does take place. And I, and I'll be the first one to tell you here in the Florida Keys, if anybody says that there's not illegal activities happening, you're just lying to yourself. Uh, what would be your recommendation? Because of the fact, obviously, we have rules, and our rules are pretty strict. Uh, I'm know. really glad you asked that question, because you could save money and make better enforcement by having large chunks instead of these little postage stamps. <coughs> because it's a real problem. And, uh, and, uh, and so, I mean, like, we see this in forest conservation. I lived in Panama for 13 years working for the Smithsonian. It's exactly the same thing with poaching in the protected forests in Panama. And, and you know, the perimeter to area enclosed gets uh, relatively smaller and smaller the larger the, the chunk that you're enclosing. And so I would, I would say that you could maximize your ability to patrol <coughs> and enforce and, and, and comparatively speaking, decrease the costs of doing that 
by going to large areas rather than small areas. California has pretty much done that. I urge you all to look at the California process. It was a state process, and it was uh, the Marine Life Protection Act for the state of Florida, uh, California. And it, it was, people yelled and screamed at each other. I actually made a bunch of public service announcements with a guy named Randy Olson about that. We made a tiny fish PSA. We had people shooting at us until they realized that we were actually on their side. And, and it was a very good process with lots of, lots of rancor, but it, it converged on an answer which is most of the way there. I don't think you get anybody in Florida to start siding with California, but I do appreciate your efforts. They have better avocados, but your oranges are better. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I've got a couple of questions on Ben Daltrey, uh, Marine Life Fishery Seat, and I've had um, a lot of comments. I'd like to talk to you at lunchtime, maybe, if we could. Because what is Marine Life Fisheries Sea? What does that mean? Is that um, I, rep rock? I represent the guys that probably take the most herbivores off of the reef. So That's right. Um, okay, thanks. And the state highly regulates us, and, and uh, we've worked very well with the state for a long time. And um, I, I can see the truth in a lot of what you're talking about up there, absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Um, the 30% limit, the big tracks, I sat on the Ecosystem Protection Working Group and that was kind of our goal as we started um, without taking any of the other factors in and then we quickly realized that you've got different um, agencies and, and uh, management regimes that you have to work within and, and that really got in the way of taking our 27 or 23 postage stamp size of spas and throwing them away and starting new with a clean slate. And, you know, we'll see what comes back with the ISs, but uh, that became more difficult than, than we originally thought. The 30%, is that a scientific number? Is that your best guess estimate? What, where does that 30% number come from? Okay, um, thank you. Um, do I need this? this um, so let's look at the history of it a little bit. Jane Lepchenko gave a talk at the first ever ocean conservation meeting attached to the Society for Conservation Biology. And she gave the opening plenary of that meeting and I gave the closing one. And Jane proposed in that meeting the 20% number. And that 20% number was based on her opinion and back of the envelope calculations. And then she promptly created uh, a big working group at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. And they came up thinking, you know, 20% was too low, but they went with the 20%. They published a ton of papers uh, supporting it. They produced a volume about it. At the same time, people like Joan Rushart <coughs> were saying, no, that's not enough. And, but doing pretty theoretical work, okay? It's models and it gets mathematical. And, and people, but that group stuck very hard on the one third number. Beyond that, you could say it's all waving your arms in theory, except that the Australians, when they rezoned the Great Barrier Reef, realized that what they were doing was inadequate. And so they upped the ante. And so for a lot of habitats, that's about the number they got. And in the California discussions, which you can imagine were very, um, rancorous, uh, especially for places like the Channel Islands. You have people pushing for 10, 15. It's, it's, it's in that lower bailiwick, but every sort of, everybody's sort of agreeing. I mean, 100% would be perfect, and that's ridiculous. And 50% and, um, would be fabulous, but it's almost certainly too much. Um, one third is more than 20% and there's a lot of good reasons for believing in it, but I'm deliberately showing you that it's not an airtight number. And you could do experiments, you could work at it. I mean, my God, if you protected 20% of the Florida Keys, if you, if you rule out, I, somebody <coughs> with one of those shirts on, tell me if I'm wrong, but, but I think if you, if you exclude Tortugas, 
you'd have a grand total of 2% of the reef tract that's protected, absolutely protected from fishing. That's ridiculous. Make that number 20% and see what happens. You hold Do you guys breed your fish? We started with that, actually, the founder of Dynasty started with Mark Moe 100 years ago, um, raising fish, but it, they're wild and caught now and regulated through the state. Um, you hold Curacao up as a, a really positive, in a positive light, and, and I've had the opportunity over the last 20 years to do a, quite a bit of diving there, and I would agree with a lot of the assessments you say. And it's got some bad places, too, as you know. Sure, sure, and, and some places that don't get dove on the north side, um, yeah. for the most part, but there is other, other The greatest problems. thing Curacao is going toward is that it's worth your life to dive on the windward side. Right. And that's the great protection. So it's fifty percent protected, almost exclusively. Yeah, and I I've, I've dived there once, and you don't see, you didn't see the Acropora plumata until you were 20, 25 feet down, because the waves are so strong. Sure, sure. Nothing but a pavement and crust and stuff. But as far as fish populations on the on the fishable and diveable side, where I've spent most of my time as well, especially large, large fish, um, they're. Less abundant than here would be my argument. There's almost none there. So that seems to me to be a place where there's pretty severe overfishing. And, um, of, of the, well, so let's give this as a dialogue, okay? Okay, so, yeah, sure. So the, that picture that I showed in the beginning with all those parrots, that's Curacao. That's the, the leeward side of Curacao. And you see a lot of big parrotfish and whatever, but you sure as hell don't see a ton of large groupers or snappers, and there are no sharks. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, the sharks are pitifully overfished throughout all those, those islands. Um, but you know, we can't just equate fish and fish. So yes, Curacao and even Bonaire are overfished for big, highly desirable species they're hanging on, in my opinion, we could argue about this, because of the fact that the parrotfish are still abundant. Mm -hmm. And then there's something that we couldn't analyze because the data aren't good enough, <coughs> but I think we're undervaluing the importance of surgeon fish. But if you look at the survey data, they're terrible. People don't know what they're counting and whatever. Parrotfish are really easy, everybody knows what they're counting. So in the end, we could only use data on snappers, groupers, and parrotfish as being really reliable, taxonomic specifically. So yes, they're overfished, and probably more overfished than here in terms of big snappers and groupers, but they've got their parrotfish. And they do have a, a hell of a lot more fish than, than anywhere in the United States or the <coughs> Islands, where, you know, it's minnows. <coughs> Yeah, go on. That's most of it. That, and you mentioned law enforcement, and we have a tremendous amount of law enforcement here compared to other places, and we all have had this conversation that, that more in law enforcement and a better use of law enforcement through different zoning is something that we definitely need to look at. So. Okay. Rob? Yes, I, I'm obviously we're together again. Uh, I just got a question, you know, about the, the one third, the twenty percent, whatever, whatever the figure is, because obviously, you know, you've seen that twenty percent uh, isn't enough. But if you could start with that, that would be fabulous. Well, and and I've heard you talk a, a lot about the the fishing impacts on fishing, and then you say that you know fisheries isn't really your your thing, and closing the the huge areas. Uh, finally, the question with regard to that is, would that include all access to all user groups? Because you also noted that in some of the other spots that you had seen impacts from divers. Uh, because we take a lot of heat just because we're fishermen. And well, we're like and, and, and you get a bum rap on that. Divers are a disaster. Um, in the paper that's going to come out, um, there are these wonderful quotes. This one guy in, in Curacao says, uh, He's always torn about showing the tourists seahorses. Because when he shows them seahorses, there's a frenzy of people who can't keep their bodies off the surface of the reef 
and there's a halo of destruction around the poor little seahorse after they're done. He gets $100 tips or more if he shows people seahorses. But, um, but there's, that, there's that consequence. There's a big literature in this, and I forgot, but I can give it to Sean and he can post it. There is a program to educate diving instructors and dive shop owners to minimize diver damage in diving. And um, it's a big international program, very well-meaning people, very smart. Uh, I met them for the first time at the International Coral Reef Initiative meetings in, in, in uh, Japan last year. And they told me, and they said, you know, they're, they're getting little bits of results, but they're discouraged. Because basically what, what dive shops do is they take somebody who doesn't know how to dive, but has a little piece of paper saying they do, and keep them alive to get them on the water to have their experience and go back. That's 95% that's of all of diving tourism. And those people are, are literally the bull in the china shop. So the proposal would be that those exclusion areas would absolutely exclude all diving as well. Thank you for your input. And, and just for the record, our fishermen have been showing their clients the, the seahorses that we've been getting them out of our golf and we've been catching in 600 feet of water. People love them. Yes. Joe and then Martin. Well, Joe actually we have Dr. Jackson, thanks for your presentation. My name is Joe Weatherby and I'm the tourism alternate. Um, I would ask you, uh, I spent a little time diving. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to locate. Oh yeah, that's me here. Yeah. Um, I spent a bit of time diving in Bonaire and the Caribbean as well. And I'm wondering, when, you, when uh, and again, overfishing is a big word, depending on who you're talking to, right? Um, um, and I'm not going to, I think I got an idea what your definition is. Well, NOAA has, NOAA, the, the Marine Fisheries Service has a very precise definition of overfishing as opposed to, say, overfished and all the rest. But what I mean by it is that the take is such that the stock <laughs> is declining or cannot recover to anything like what was its original all right, well, and, and, uh, and I thought that we were, that was a ballpark you were playing in, but uh, <laughs> Florida Keys, do, do any of these analyses that you've shown us, I've spent a lot of time in Bonaire, a lot of time in Barbados, both of these places are relatively far away from things like uh, the, what we have here in the backcountry and the mangroves and these things that serve like hatcheries that kind of support some of these populations. Is, is any of that a factor in some of this research? And uh, if so, uh, is that considered, I guess? Is what I'm it's, uh, it's really important. And um, Curacao and Bonaire and Aruba and Los Roques all benefit from the vast areas of mangroves on the mainland, which, as you know, is not any further than, than we are right here from uh, Cuba. And so, because they don't have vast areas. I'm curious how, because of that, the harbor, Willemstadt and whatever, has some. Uh, Bonaire does not have a lot, but, and the, you know, the recruitment studies certainly show that um, there is seeding from afar. Although there's a lot more self-recruitment than we ever realized. We now know that genetically, whatever. Mangroves are hugely important. You, you've destroyed, um, that student of mine who did the historical study of the Florida Keys, you, there are maps of mangrove extent from 100 years ago or 150 years ago. And you, meaning all of us, have destroyed the majority of it, right? But you still have a hell of a lot of mangroves. That's one of the things in your favor. And I think you're protecting them pretty well, that's what I'm told. And as long as you keep doing that, that's a really important measure for management because we all know, and not just the mangroves, the seagrass beds. 
I mean, all those scour marks you see from the air, I mean, this is something Billy has been on for so long. I mean, seagrass is also, the mangrove seagrass nexus is incredibly important as a nursery. And since you, you got more of it than most, that's an asset that you should continue to protect. I mean, I, you know, the thing is, I do understand the, the economic implications of what I said, but you're in potentially much, much better shape than someplace like Jamaica. But right now, you're as bad as Jamaica in terms of the condition of reach. But your chance to improve it is vastly greater, not just because of the wealth of this country, but also because um, the social pressures are different. And so you could do that. Is that all? Yes. Yeah. Bob Smith, uh, background, more, uh, here I am, uh, more in social science. I have two questions, if I, if I may, we'll do them one at a time. Uh, first, uh, do your studies, or do you know of any studies, that would give you any indication, even if it's not quantitative, of um, if we did, we invested in the education and the enforcement, two issues, which we say are very important here. If the investment were made there, given no change but the existing regulations and so forth that exist, uh, to what extent that might deal with the problem, have impact on the problem? It would have been great 25 or 35 years ago. But right now, you're at apocalypse now. And you just, you can't afford to wait. Um, I'm actually really interested in the social science. And I, I wanted to show you a slide that isn't ready for prime time. <laughs> um, but if you, if you do a really simple thing, and you take all the places for which there's data on parrotfish abundance, biomass, coral cover, and macroalgal cover, and then you ordinate them. You arrange them in that, in, in space, in terms of how they vary in just those three parameters. You will get, on one side of the graph, you will get Bermuda Flower Gardens, Curacao, Bonaire, Little Cayman Islands, um, Vieques, uh, a bunch of places. On one side, and you'll get Florida Keys and Jamaica and USBI, most of the Bahamas, but not the park, which will be on the right side. So they'll come out that way. Then take those same places and ordinate them in terms of GNP, governance, regulation, remoteness, tourism pressure, population density, and agriculture, and you get exactly the same graph. So what that's telling you is how we behave is the driver. And in my opinion, this is so important, I'm not going to publish it until we've done everything possible to falsify it. But it's really clear, and you know, you know how you do the governance thing. Um, uh, it's, it's, as the U.S. government, they won't tell you who they consider to be corrupt. The Dutch are happy to tell you who they consider it. So there, there's an official Dutch government governance index, which Mark from <coughs> and Carmody and Curacao got for me. Uh, and and um, there are six components of governance, and they include things like corruption, uh, degree of you know, regulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so you get a you get a government index. In the United States, we're really schizophrenic because we're incredibly good at some kinds of governance and pretty bad at others, like, say, oil. And, and so, so we're, we're in the better side for that. And we got the wealth that we have and everything. Somehow or another, though, all of that, we managed to screw it up. So there is a, there's the potential for very important socioeconomic work. This is a socioeconomic problem. It's not a science problem. Science is done. 
I mean, he may be right about the special case of aspects of the special case of the Florida Keys. And I'd love to see the experiments done to find out. But, but, but there's no question about the overall pattern. The question is whether or not we have the socioeconomic government's capacity to do something. Thank you for the segue into my second question. There you go. It says social economic yeah. predominant, in it, and that is, uh, of course, we're we're very sensitive to social social economic uh, implications of doing nothing of the, of the problem. Yeah. My question would be: Is is anybody doing studies on what the immediate social impact, social economic impact would be? on the Florida Keys, if you implemented everything you had up there on board? Well, hey, <laughs> I mean, I'll bet you there are people in the back room who have done that. Uh, I, I mean, I would argue, actually, that the simple one, and it's sort of sad, uh, because of the fact that it's simple, the simple one is to protect one-third from use. Uh, you have to be careful to sort of regulate the pressure in the other two-thirds of the places. But you're not going to reduce the number of hotel rooms. I mean, most of the people who come here don't give a damn about what's in the water. I, my room was right opposite those large tanks that come in and out on a, a daily basis. And you watch those people, the first thing they do is go to the shops here, which is why this hotel is where it is. And they don't give a damn about it the water. Um, so you're not going to make a dent in them by protecting one third of the reef or 20% uh, from overfishing and divers, clunky divers. So that's one you could do right away. Uh, the pain, I mean you have too many hotels, you have too much tourist capacity, you, you have to think through the Antarctic example, the regulation, the cap on the number of people that are allowed to go to the place. And, and I, surely that would be really painful. I mean, it, there's just no way it would not be painful. I suppose you could go high end. You know, I mean, you could go, and, and, and in fact, wouldn't it be nicer? I mean, I'm sure the people who live here in Key West would like to see 99% of those people go away unless they own a store. But, but, um, there, there are tourists that will pay five times the rate of what the average person coming here is paying, and if you reorient to a high-end market, then you get to diminish the impact and still make a lot of money. I'm, I'm sure the pain is measurable by some. Oh yeah, but some that's not my job. I, 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 I stick to my job. Yeah, but there are there are, in Australia. You know, it's really fascinating that the head of the Tourism Council. I don't remember whether he's for all of Australia, for tourism in all of Australia, or just the Queensland region and the Great Barrier Reef. But I've been at two meetings and on a nationally televised panel with this guy, and his message, loud and clear, is aim for the high-end market, aim for the quality experience. That can allow us to make major inroads in GBR conservation and still make a ton of money from tourism. It's very, very interesting. Uh, I'm terrible with names, but I could, I could dredge it up. And, and people are listening to it. I think uh, Skip's going to Oh my god. Uh, yeah, th this is just, a, <laughs> <laughs> just a, very, a, a very quick comment. And that's that there is a, a, a biological deterrent to diver damage on the reefs that has an important positive ecological uh, factor as well, and that's diadema. <laughs> you know what I thought you were going to say? I thought you were going to say sharks. One of the things that drives me insane, and I will look at my new friend from fishing uh, when I say this, because I'm guessing you're going to agree with me, but you know, I hear all the time those goddamn sharks, they're stealing our fish. But you got like one-tenth of one percent of the abundance of sharks you used to have. If shark abundance was anything the way it used to be, and I am not promoting this, you would not be do, able to do diving science in the Caribbean. There's a famous painting, Watson and the Shark, 
of this bizarre, it's in the National Gallery of American Art, of this bizarrely naked sailor who's fallen into the ocean, and this humongous shark with a mouth this big is about to eat the guy, and Watson is the bold man with the spear who spears the shark. I mean, sharks, bull sharks, swam up the rivers on the south coast of Cuba and took cattle five miles up river. I mean, sharks were all over the place. And I don't think any of us want to have that many sharks anymore. But I mean, that, that used to be the greatest impediment to, to diving. Yeah, OK, Billy. Jeremy, thank you very much. You know, every time I hear you talk, uh, it makes me feel alive. I go, my blood pressure goes up and down. <laughs> careful, careful. They're going to all say, Jeremy, kill Bill. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I want to say thank you for including the Flower Garden Banks uh, data. And, and uh, that's in, the reason I say that is because you do get that baseline of a coral reef that is way offshore. And I think it is, it is one of those um, uh, areas that serves as, a, as a, uh, something that we can measure against and continue to watch. For some data for your future, I wanted to let you know that we're 40 mi we're about you know, maybe 20, 20 miles closest, closer to Havana than we are the closest Walmart. <laughs> so that's just something for you to put away. In 1973, when I moved to the Keys, there were zero cruise ship landings. In 2005, we had 525 landings in one year. That number's gone down now considerably, but it's coming, it's starting to stabilize and may not come back up. Cruise ships are another area where you could go to the luxury market. Um, I'm not a big fan of cruise ships. I'd rather rent a sailboat than sail, but, but um, if you look at the nature of the cruise ship industry, it's very multimodal. And there are ships that get also aim towards people who are looking for a very different experience from getting off the boat and going to Little Switzerland. And, 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 um, and they, those people spend a lot of money. So, so it, it's, it, it's an opportunity and it's, a, and it's a problem. I don't remember what the case looked like in 1948. I've seen a picture of me as this naked, scrawny kid wandering around with another naked scrawny kid on a beach. What an image. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll never see it, Bill. But what I do remember, but what I do remember, I remember it really well, is getting in our little 14-foot dinghy and sailing across Biscayne Bay and catching a mackerel in the first 30 seconds and then stopping fishing, because that was enough for one. <clears throat> or doing the same thing off of Key Largo or whatever and not seeing, go to Key Largo, get in a little boat, sail out of ways, and not see anybody for four hours. So, I mean, we will not and probably should not go back to that. I mean, it's absurd. We can't go home again. But, but it is a measure of the acceleration of the impact which has taken place. Because I am a very young 72. <laughs> I want um, a couple more real quick points, and then I want to get your reaction to them. Uh, you talked about governance in different areas, and uh, I wanted to share with you something about Cuba. You mentioned Cuba, and uh, I was in a meeting with Maritza Garcia Garcia, who heads up all the national parks. You know Maritza, and in all the marine protected areas of Cuba, and they have done a phenomenal job. They have 20% of their areas fully set aside as protected. And I asked her one time, I said, Maritza, how do you do that? <laughs> and, she, and she looked at me and smiled. She said, Billy, we just draw the lines. And, and I realized in our form of government, which is really... It's a better like, form of government. A better form of government and something that I totally respect. We, we have a different way of going through that process. And it made me think, I would just love, you know how you take a child to, to work with you? God, I'd love to take you to work with me for about a week. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's going to be very interesting what happens in Cuba. So no, <coughs> I think I'll tell you, I'll give you my take. I think they have a strong government and a strong leader, and I think he's going to whatever you think of him. And I think he'll negotiate very hard, and he'll be able to maintain those protections. 
um, and that it will be, uh, and, and that will survive. And that's really valuable for all of us because the fish population, the populations are so so, but the fish are great. And they represent a source for every place. So we, we all have a, a, an investment in the south coast of Cuba in terms of being a source for larvae and all, all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. Anybody else? <coughs> Jeremy. John Hunt, as, as, as you well know, Jeremy, I work for that agency, uh, used to be called Foreign Fish and Game that you reference. Um, as does your law enforcement protection, I might add. I'm not doing off duty, so I'm not affiliated. But it just struck me because it just struck me that uh, I don't know if I can pull this off, but I'm going to extend to you just a, a generic invitation to see if I can pull off to maybe have a, uh, uh, a presentation to, to my agency's uh, leadership to get a broader understanding. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that would be a very interesting uh, You know, so and not, I, and I not only would I like to do it, if he comes with me. <laughs> well, he's a leader. I mean, <laughs> okay, but I would like to do it with Lauren. I think that's a very good Because the reason I like to do that is, you know, we all know that PhD advisors just sit back and give orders. <laughs> and Lauren is the one who collected all the Florida relevant data. And as I think you also know, we've just been talking about the reefs, but she did that brilliant paper right. on the sponge fisheries, right? Right. And we worry about coral disease and everything. Um, when I was a graduate student in Discovery Bay, Jamaica, there was a guy named Henry Ricewick who studied the sponges. And Henry demonstrated, and the reef at Discovery Bay was beautiful, and it went from zero to the drop-off and the Cayman Trench in about half a mile offshore. And Henry studied all the sponges, and he, he studied the rate at which they pumped water, the volume of water they pumped per day, and he looked at what they swallowed, the food that went in, and he looked at what came out. And he calculated two things. He demonstrated that the sponges on that fringing reef filtered the entire equivalent of all the water up to the sea surface every 24 hours. And he also showed that those sponges invented the millpore filter because virtually nothing came out after it had passed through the sponge. So nature gave coral reefs these amazing cleansing filters. And remember, she calculated the volume of sponges that were harvested from the whole west coast of Cuba. And you know, those sponges, they filtered, I'm going to give you a made up number, but it's got to be true. They filtered the water of the entire Caribbean Sea every year. And, and, and so, and when we talk about diseases, including the great sponge diseases that wiped out the fishery, or the seagrass diseases, there's very good reason to believe that the outbreak of those diseases is related the, the killing of the biological filter that used to be there. And that's the same in the Chesapeake Bay with the oysters. We killed the biological filter by over-harvesting the oysters, and then we see all these oyster diseases that make it so <coughs> difficult to restore them. So I think it'd be really fun to do it with her because what her work shows is how subtle and multi-dimensional these problems are. I'm gonna go to work on it. We'll see what happens. But I'm okay. Go work on it. Just give me a warning and give me a hint. <laughs> you know, this is one of these things that requires delaying months and months and months in advance. Okay, I can. So, and so do you. I understand. I know, and not months and months. Months. Your uh, buddy over here would like to talk to you again. Oh my God, there's a lot. Of What's going on now? Oh, and I have another. But before that, buddy, I forgot Susie right here, right next to me, wanted to. I'm Susie Roblane. I also served on the Ecosystem Protection Working Group where we were trying to create 
uh, zone, new zones, bigger, larger zones. We had a, a, a lot of work we did on that for a couple years. Um, and I wanted you to address um, one of the things that we spent a lot of time on while we were working through this to see where it would work to make these bigger zones or closed areas was identifying whether we could work with everyone could live with if we chose more productive or specific areas with um, features that may be identified and some of them including where there were spawning aggregations um, and then you mentioned well just close a third of the reef track so how important like if you did say pick a larger spot to uh, to let things just be and see how things could you know come bounce back how important was it to choose the real productive areas and the second part was um, on spawning aggregations which we really wanted to see closures like you mentioned there was a lot of talk about well it would work if we just did it temporally and there was some controversy on that. I wanted you to address that. Well, the, the last one I'll answer first. Because one of the things I discovered when I went to the GCFI meetings in Barbados last fall was uh, Brian Luckhurst, who used to run fisheries <coughs> in Bermuda, gave a talk about a new group or spawning aggregation that he discovered and that they shut down immediately based on their previous experience. That's actually, if I remember correctly, it's a seasonal closure. So what they did was they did the research to find out exactly when the spawning was going on. They close it during the spawning and then they open it up again. So I think that's the answer to your question. Um, if you look at the Great Barrier Reef process, or the California coastal process, they have one thing in common, which is that you just got to look at the full diversity of habitats, and you have to embrace protection of that full diversity of habitats. You just can't stick the protected areas in the unproductive places. You have to put them in all the different kinds of places, and that does get a little bit more difficult with the goal of having them be as big as possible. Um, I would urge you all to look at the, uh, I've forgotten where they were posted, but so a man people either love or hate, Andy Rosenberg, used to be the head of fisheries for New England. And Andy shut down George's bank. And you think you got problems? I mean, he was hung in effigy everywhere. Uh, he was threatened. Uh, he, he shut it down. I mean, you know, that's the last vestige of anything in the Northeast. And, and so there was this big, huge closed area. And, and everybody, all the fishermen said, done work, done work, waste of time, still totally ridiculous. You look at aerial photographs, and it's wall-to-wall -wall fishing boats all around the perimeter of the closed area. That's how well they don't work. Right? Just waiting for some stupid fish to, to swim across the line. So, um, yeah, I, I we, you know, you wouldn't be an idiot to go, here's 10 miles, here's 20 miles, here's 10 miles, here's 20 miles. That would be stupid. But you sort of want to incorporate that principle while you looked at the diversity of the habitats. That's what Enrique did. I urge you to look at that paper. It's a really good paper. It's, it's Enrique Sala and a bunch of other people, and it's, it's a proposal for the zoning of the Gulf of California. That's what the Australians did in the Great Barrier Reef. That's what uh, California did. None of these things are perfect, but they all worked with that, those principles. And you again. Yes, me again. Uh, and I've got lots of questions. I've just been trying to, to hold off so that everybody can go and ask theirs. Uh, and I would love the opportunity to chat with you outside of this, you know, via email, whichever medium is appropriate, or invite you down to my aunt's place in Bonaire. Uh, That's an awful. 
<laughs> so is that a good one? We might be able to make that happen. She, she goes by me for Nat Geo if that helps. Uh, getting back to this, this one third thing, as you can see as a fisherman, I'm kind of stuck on this. Uh, if you took and you did a reduction in that area of that size, if you did not reduce the amount of anglers or participants you know, in the activities, would you be able to displace them and still have a level of success, or do you have to close that area and also reduce the number of, of accessibility points? Oh, well, I, logistically, I don't, I don't know about the accessibility points, but I, I'll tell you what I worry about. Uh, and it was the mistake that Andy Rosenberg made, so they hated his name. Because when he shut down George's Bank, he didn't protect the Gulf of Maine. And so everybody from Gloucester went to the Gulf of Maine, and they nuked it. I have a house way up down east in the Gulf of Maine. And when I eat haddock, which I think tastes better than cod, it sure as hell doesn't come in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so that's a big concern. I also, as much as, much as I believe in closures because they're enforceable. I also believe in a sane environment. I believe in a combination of closures and real regulation. So, and, and I, I would expect that, I know it's true in other places, the fishermen who obey the law, they rat on the people who don't with regard to safe spawning it. And that's a great control mechanism. Because they're screwing the people who are honest, right? And so um, so I, I would say that, I mean, I, I like this one third number because everything in me scientifically says that's the right number. Uh, if you did and anything less than 20% is sort of peeing in the wind. If you did that, and at the same time, you developed that you could all agree on very clear regulations on behavior. You could give it a go. And again, I'm not the local expert, so I, I don't know about the details. The biggest concern about marine protected areas is not that they work. They work. There's no evidence to the contrary that they work, at least for fish. But there is also evidence that there's a limit to how much area you can protect unless you also do something about the pressure in the other places. And I'm sure there are a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, regulating illegal fishing more effectively is one way to reduce that pressure. Um, and I don't know about the rest, but I mean, I'm sure you guys could come up with a, with a mechanism to achieve them. Well, we'll work on it. And also that regulating illegal fishing part, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is because of the fact that it, it kind of crosses the line between both your world and mine, is in any of your studies worldwide, things that you've seen have anything to do with uh, effectiveness of artificial reef systems as far as helping the, the corals and the, the fishes come back? <clears throat> I really hate artificial reefs. Probably more than I'm justified in hating them. Because, because, you know, let's go take all our old cars and dump them on a reef and it'll be good. And I, I just can't stand that. Um, hard substrate in a place which is nothing but a level bottom creates a habitat for certain kinds of fish. But remember, there's a carrying capacity too. And so, uh, a lot of the time, all it does is attract the fish from other places. It doesn't increase the number of fish. Um, and there's a lot of garbage pseudoscience on the subject of artificial reefs, which is why people like me really hate it. Uh, but my mind isn't closed about it. I just say that, that it's not where I go. Um, because I think there's so many other things that you could do uh, that would be more effective. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Um, Carolyn? Um, Carolyn McLaughlin, I work with the National Parks Conservation Association. So a lot of my work is centered on kind of advocating for better policies and stricter policies that promote conservation of marine resources within the national parks or adjacent areas. And some of the huge problems that I face are, you know, how can we communicate the importance of these areas? And so, of course, you can make the ecological argument, but unfortunately, that doesn't really hold as much sway as it should. So it really comes down to the economics of it. And I'm just wondering, have there been a lot of kind of corresponding short and long-term economic evaluations of, you know, what are the impacts of creating stricter marine protected areas? How does this affect local economies, and how does the value of the reef change over time? Okay. Um, first of all, even if you do an economic assessment, I used to teach a course with a man named Richard Carson who did the ex the economic valuation of the Exxon Valdez. He's the person who did it. It was really interesting. The night of the wreck, three people called him up. The feds, the state of Alaska, and Exxon Mobil. And he chose to work for the state of Alaska because he knew he'd have more power. And he did this path-breaking economic valuation of Prince of the Senate, right? And it's really interesting because there's the predictable loss of fishing I mean, those are our most productive fisheries, are in Alaska, so it's very clear. But there was a huge, va and, and this valuation study was done all over the United States, so people in Kansas were also filling in answers to this, this survey, this valuation. And there's a significant minority of people who say the beauty of the place, even though they will never go and visit it, is important to us and has a value, okay? so. What that means is it's subtle as hell, because it's not just the obvious ones. The biggest problem with the economic valuation of coral reefs is that nobody will believe the, the most important value, which is coastal protection. So it's very easy to value fisheries. It's very easy to value sports fisheries in terms of their economic value, the number of people who care and whatever. Um, it's very easy to value tourism and diving. How do you value, if you're in Belize, how do you value the existence of a healthy barrier reef, which keeps growing up to sea level, that protects you from the full force of 250 kilometers an hour for 24 hours? So a few people are trying to do this, and you can imagine the result. They get a big number for fishing and tourism, and they get a number that goes to the top of the Eiffel Tower for the protection. But people don't take that seriously, even though it's true. People in Miami are gonna take it real seriously any day. But until it happens, they'll laugh and say, it doesn't mean anything. So that's what you're up against because you don't wanna wish a Category 5 on Miami, do you? Uh, after that happens, uh, everybody will understand the value because so much has been destroyed there from when I used to be a kid. A lot of the protective value has been destroyed there. Um, so economic valuation is a very important tool, but at the end of the day, it's not going to sway the people as much as you'd like. and. Um, you know, um, I give a lot of public lectures, and when people ask me what can I do, and whatever, I say the biggest problem we've got is that we used to be a country of citizens governed by leaders of our citizenship. Now we are a country of consumers governed by a facilitator of our consumption. So there's an ethical gap. There's a, a shift that's changed. And that's why your job is so hard. And, and, and so, at the end of the day, what you need is leadership. Theodore Roosevelt was a great leader. I'm a Democrat. He was a Republican. Theodore Roosevelt was a great, great leader for the environment. He created your national park. He created Yellowstone. The timber industry was totally against him. And he did it. And, he, and 
When asked about why he did it, he said he did it because it was the right thing to do. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Wait. <laughs> I just want to thank you for coming. You know, you you spoke the truth. A lot of people don't want to hear truth, and they might not agree with you. But um, I've been in the trenches doing a lot of a lot of work and trying to convince people that there's that we need to take action. And uh, you know, it just falls on deaf ears. This climate change. You know, I'm not denying there's climate change, but it's not the problem right now. And there's things we can do. Climate change. Let me say something. Climate change is a huge problem. Oh, it's a, yeah. But it hasn't been the major driver yet. It's going to get worse. The good news, of the, and we, the good news of this study is that if we do all this local protection stuff, the corals are more resilient to climate change. There may or may not be a limit to that value. But it's going to take a long time to get to that limit. And that's, so climate change is important, but in that context. Well, I was trying to agree with your assessment. And, uh, but <laughs> okay, I think, I'm sorry, but I, I, I had so many people tell me I'm an idiot for <laughs> saying that climate change is not important. No, I, I, I'm trying to agree with you. <laughs> sorry. And I think there's a lot of things we can and should do, and that's why I appreciate you coming down and um, just telling it like it is, and, and there's a lot of people in this room that absolutely do not believe you, and the tourism industry in Florida doesn't believe you, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission may not believe you, but I think you're speaking truth, and I would wish that more people would at least listen to it. Um, yeah, and I'm getting into trouble, but <clears throat> uh, I, I just appreciate it. I appreciate you coming down. You know, any one of us had said the same things, we would uh, have flat tires and our house would be nuked. And, <laughs> but uh, I just would take it all to heart. That, uh, and I've done a lot of the, you know, read a lot of his stuff and I've learned a lot of the stuff. There's a lot of good research out there and, you know, we have a big problem and we're sticking our head in the sand, ignoring it. I've been diving down here since the early 70s, 1969, I started diving down here. And it's a shadow of what it was. It's never coming back unless we make some serious changes. And the people that say everything is great, no, they don't know what great is. They, they know it was five years ago and they think it's still great. It's not great. And, uh, you know, we're either going to change it or we're going to watch it all wash away. And people are going to come down and sit under palm trees and look at the sunsets. And, you know, and that's what the Florida Keys are going to be. And I'd hate to see that happen. So. There's more questions, but I, we have a few more minutes. So, uh, Dave, if you want to pop in there. And... Yes, I noticed there's a letter from Mayor Cates requesting a voting <coughs> membership from the county, uh, That's uh, from the lot. city, right. for this organization. Uh, I was just, and also probably from Virginia Penteco, Tourist Development Council, isn't she? Are, are they in the back of the room? Do I miss seeing them? Uh, have they been to some of these uh, meetings? Uh, did they hear our lecture this morning? No. Thank you. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, uh, there were a lot of, there was a lot of work referenced by Dr. Jackson. Uh, is there any way, is there any way, did anybody take notes as to all those, a meat case study, all these? Okay, yeah, I would like, to, I would like to, could somebody send me an email with a link to something? This will be on the website, and it's been taped, and it's also been broadcast live. So this entire presentation and discussion... Can we give them an exam is, after? And it's, the minutes will come out with soon enough. But it's an excellent presentation. Yeah, you want to share it with people because uh, it's easier when somebody from the outside comes in and gives the bad news. But the bad news is the news, and it's the truth. So. And the good news. That's true. It's possible to fix it. Yeah, and I think that's the that's what excited me about uh, when I read the article in the New York Times, and uh, when this book came out, and you and your wife did an interview on uh, you know a video interview, and it's a, it is a, a message that there is something that can be done. There is hope. It's not all gone, but we need to address it. We need to do what we can do. And, and there's a lot we can do. So, did I see one other hand? Maybe not. All right. So. Great discussion. We have uh, an hour and 15 minutes for lunch, so try to be back here by 
I think it's about 1.30. Okay, we've had too much fun. Time to get back to work. Um, <clears throat> Sean, I have you down as taking this one. You want to pop up and you know, sit, sit there? Um, I'll just kind of sit here. This, um, th this is on the agenda for, for uh, a half an hour. Um, we had a lot of discussions uh, lately at the, at the City Commission, the U.S. City Commission. Uh, uh, a lot of discussions with Mayor Cates, and, um, uh, discussions with members of the public, and uh, in, in speaking with uh, Mayor Cates, he, he came to me with a request um, to add a seat to the Sanctuary Advisory Council, uh, a voting seat for the city of Key West. And, and uh, this occurred a couple months ago. Uh, we kept kind of talking about it, uh, and, and he met with uh, director Dan Bosta, who was, who was in town for the, the, the last advisory council meeting, um, and I told him, hey, I, I can put this on the agenda for the advisory council uh, coming up in April. Happy to do it. Uh, get us a letter, and in everyone's packet, you should have the formal letter from the city to us, from Mayor Cates, uh, to uh, for the, for this request. Um, unfortunately, Mayor Cates is in, uh, he's, has to be in the Bahamas. Um, uh, yeah, well, makes the boat easy. Today. <laughs> Mayor Case goes to some nice places, so you know. But uh, you know, for and, but this was actually an official event for, uh, to go to their sister city uh, uh, to the some equipment that was dedicated uh, over there. And so, unfortunately, he could not be here today. However, we do have uh, City Commissioner uh, Tony Ennis is here also to speak on behalf of the city. You're welcome to go up to that mic. And, uh, um, express the views it, it, as as the mayor noted in his uh, in his letter. You know that uh, with the, the high density of the city of Key West, number of tourists visiting Key West, specifically Key West, um, and he, he talks about the stands of reason that due to our extreme economic and environmental impact on the communities, specific representation for our city is very much needed. So that that was the request from the mayor. Uh, just the process wise, that you know, this is up for advisory council discussion to add a seat to the to the sanctuary advisory council a voting seat um, it would require a change in the charter uh, in, in your charter and, and that is uh, not that's not something the advisory council can do or, or i can do that actually uh, the, the, the director dan boston would have to approve that as well as the attorneys in, in dc but the first thing we're going to do now is what does the advisory council think? Mm -hmm. And so you always start with the advisory council and anything you do. Um, so, uh, and, and certainly Commissioner Yen is, is, is here to, to, to represent the city of Key West and, and here for the discussion. Uh, thank you, Sean. I was going to say, although the mayor couldn't make it, it you bet you're behind the city is here. Uh, we want to be represented very much so. Uh, I was asked to read the letter that the mayor put uh, forth on it. Thank the officer for giving, giving me the cheaters because it looked like uh, Chinese to me for a moment there. And first of all, I want to thank Dr. Jackson for an outstanding presentation. I, I suggested to him briefly in the lobby that uh, I'm going to, to Cuba Friday and I'll be talking to some of the officials there and I would, I would love to have him give that presentation in Cuba as they're our sister, uh, sister island and I'm very much concerned with what happens here and vice versa. This is from uh, uh, the Mayor Craig Cates. Uh, dear Mr. Nedemeyer, please accept this letter as a formal request on behalf of the city of Key West for the National Marine Sanctuary to grant a representative seat to our city on its advisory council. There are currently members serving to represent Monroe County as a whole. It is our position as a city that we have specific circumstances unique to our island can only be clearly and thoroughly advocated by someone who represents us independently from the county. Our city has a higher density and population than any other city in the county and a large number of visitors with just over 2.6 million tourists per year visiting the city of Key West, specifically of the 2.8 million who visited the entire county. These are Tourism Development Council estimates calculated for the year 2013. 
It stands to reason that due to our extreme economic and environmental impact in the Florida Keys, specific representation for our city is very much needed. Thank you for your consideration for this request. Best regards, Chris Kate. I want to just quickly <coughs> say I totally concur with the mayor. I think that it's imperative that there be a clear and concise and direct line of communication between this council and the city of Key West. We obviously have a vested interest, not just financial, but much more so in the quality of life for our citizens. Um, and while I understand even more so after Dr. Jackson's presentation how important it is for us to preserve our resources, I think that we also need to make sure that we don't disenfranchise our fishermen for their ability to make a living. Um, and it should be noted that, that a lot of the commercial fishing that has devastated the fish stocks on our planet is not the kind of fishing that we necessarily do here. And it, finally, in closing, and uh, you know, he's heard me say this before and I'll say it again. Any governmental agency that implies any policy that does not include some kind of concurrence from the fishermen, that policy is doomed to failure. You do not have enough regulations, you do not have enough uniforms, badges, guns, and boats to make them come into, into order unless they buy into it. I think they want to buy into it because it's their legacy is for their children and their grandchildren. Please include them and please give serious consideration to have the city of Key West have a direct voice. Thank you very much. So we can have a motion or we can have a discussion. I should have a motion if there's a motion to forward this, Clinton. I'd like to say something if I could. Okay, well, is there going to be a motion first? If there's no motion, then it's not going to go anywhere. Don? I'll make this motion. Make a motion to, to uh, go along. recommend including city the city of Key West on the Council of yep. Representatives. Okay. Do I have a second? We have a motion to include the city of Key West. Do I have a second? I'll second your discussion. Okay. You Dave, make peace second. So. So a couple of weeks ago in the newspaper, I read um, about how the chamber and I guess the Fishermen's Association had come to the city commission. And the city commission basically, and correct me if I'm incorrect here, Commissioner Hernandez, but didn't the commission say that they didn't want the sanctuary to make any changes at all to the, to the regulations that might adversely affect the, the fishing people? What we're doing right now is same thing with the cruise ship study. We wanted to go out and get some more information so we can make factual decisions not just knee-jerk reactions to the pressure of a lobby group that comes and speaks to you. It was you and two other commissioners, three other commissioners, or two others actually, I guess, that voted um, to restrict it, anything that the sanctuary could do. And I don't know, I, you, you just complimented Jeremy on his presentation this morning, and I'd just kind of like to know how, you've, how you can justify both of those positions. Well, let, let me say this. What we're actually opposed to is, you know, there's a fine line between fish count, fish size, et cetera, and some of the work of the sanctuary bleeds over into that, and we firmly believe, per the Magnuson Act of 1976, fish counts, fish quarters, et cetera, fall directly under the purview of the state of Florida. That's the vote that we make. The only, the only objection we have as a commission is that we don't, uh, that we disallow any kind of uh, repercussions to the commercial fishermen in our city. That's why we made the motion that we made. I applaud Dr. Jackson. I think it needs to be looked at. But here's part of the issue that you have. You have overfishing, you have development, you have agricultural runoff, and you have tourism. Well, let's start with agricultural runoff. Big sugar, big money, good luck. Cruise ships, big money, good luck. Development, big money, good luck. Who's got the small pockets? Fishermen. So I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure that we have a voice as a city that represents both keeping and protecting our natural resources, but also speaking for the fishermen. That's all. And I don't see those things as being mutually exclusive. Thank you. Okay, make peace. And then skip. <coughs> um, I guess if, you know, granted, there's, there's a QS City QS has a cast a larger shadow of population and, and tourism wise, but I think you open this door and then what about the city of Marathon 
What about the village of Almirana? What about Key Colony? About Leighton? And, um, and, and if we're going to do that, first of all, I'll need a bigger room. But if we're going to do that, I might be all right with that. But I'm, but I'm not sure I'm in favor of, of entertaining this change just for the city of Key West. I think that, that um, sets an unreasonable precedent or an unrealistic precedent. Martin and then uh, uh, I, I'm remen reminded of that old phrase, taxation without representation, which does not directly apply, but at least in, in uh, at the basics of it do. And I'm not terribly opposed to having municipalities be represented on this board. After all, the Monroe County Commission is represented on the board. But having said that, I agree with Dave that it could make for a rather unwieldy uh, situation as far as the interest of the, uh, of the sanctuary and, and <clears throat> the uh, components of the, of the community are concerned. So I'm not terribly in favor of it uh, uh, for that reason. But on the other hand, uh, a possibly a non-voting representation from the, and I understand that the letter calls for a voting representation, but the Monroe County Commission is is not a voting, or is it? Yeah, they are. They are. Okay, well, then that sets a precedence there. But uh, they're set up in the name of paper. Local government is part of the name of paper. Correct. Yeah, that, that is the local Correct. government. That is the representation from local government. Okay, and the, the municipalities are not included in that. Maybe they should be, but I, uh, I don't know. If I were going to vote for it, I, I'd probably vote against it at this point anyway, until I get much more information on just what that might entail. Um, I'm looking at the list of council members now, and you talk about not enough representation when it comes to the fishing industry. And I'm looking at, we have eight plus seats representing various factions of the fishing industry. I'm also looking that equally represented between the lower fees and middle fees and upper fees. There are citizens of large positions, diving, tourism. Those guys that are representing the lower keys are representing Key West. They all come from Key West. So I don't see where there's a disparity in their voice in this panel. I was just going to mimic that same thought. I was going to do it by a show of hands. Um, if, if you're at the table and you live, your primary residence is in Key West or, or work in Key West, could you guys raise your hand so we can see how many representatives of Key West are here right now? That's a loss. Wow. I would dare say that while well, Key West has a Seven. <laughs> I, I would dare say that while well, Key West obviously has a tremendous impact on the Florida Keys, um, they also are probably overrepresented. Um, not not that, that I would say, or at least fairly represented. There are lots of people from Key West that are represented at this table that uh, work in Key West, that live in Key West, and that um, you know care about what happens in Key West. Uh, both uh, environmentally and economically. So I do think there's good rep representation of that here. And I do worry about what they even Skip said, which is you can't necessarily, you go down this road and it starts to unravel and then you have every other city is gonna want that same ability and, uh, and rightfully so, I think. So um, that's where I'm at with it. Rob? Yes, uh, uh, my thoughts on it, you know, because we had a conversation about this at, at lunch today, is that, one, I do support the, the independent cities. I most we broke down the EWG for them to have a say. Uh, the reason I believe that is kind of with the taxation without representation because of the fact that everybody that sits here on this board was appointed or selected by this board. Uh, anybody can fill in for any seat that's available and get it. Uh, my predecessor, uh, Ted Lund, was on the flats. 
He was not a flats fisherman, but he filled a seat as a flats fisherman. Uh, that is now vacant, has been vacant. Nothing is stopping any of these other guys from getting that position. Uh, you can get a lot of special interest, you know, through a, a measure like that. And for years, you know, even at the, the federal level, I've tried to get my local city involved in what's happening federally with the, the regulations, specifically towards fishing, uh, because that would be my only one way to voice my opinion of how well my representation is doing, because it'd be a position that I vote on. Uh, not necessarily the person that sits here <clears throat> on this council, but I think that there should be uh, some way to set up the, the major population areas to have them represented as a city and designate their own who's going to come to it, which I know is probably an administrative nightmare because you, know, you have to create that. But it has to apply across the board. So as far as supporting you know, just one you know, batch or anybody else that just wants to come and represent Key West as an individual, that I'm not so much against or not so much for. Uh, but had this meeting be, been held in Key Largo right now, you might not have as much Key West representation. At that point, you could have Key Largo representation. Because if it was in Key Largo right now, Steve Leopold would be sitting in this chair, not me. It's in Key West. I'm here. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Heather and then Bob Smith. Thank you, Mr. Hi, well, um, as the county commissioner um, who's filling in for George today, um, first I would like to say that this is not taxation without representation because I'm elected by people from Key West all the way to Ocean Reef. So your county commissioners uh, do represent all the municipalities. Um, secondly, I, I, I do think that there's a strong argument for if you're going to allow one municipality, you must give that opportunity to all of them. And I could argue that it might even be more important for a place like Isla Mirada that, that depends so much on water resources for its tourism industry, or Key Largo, where diving is so important, and frankly, where the impacts of our neighbor, five million neighbors to the north are felt even more greatly than they are here. So. Um, at, at what point does this board then become uh, almost unwieldy? I would also like to suggest that I think there's a, actually an open lower keys seat right now that we're waiting to be uh, for someone to apply to, and I don't think that there's anything in the rules preventing a, a city commissioner from applying for that seat. Um, and further, I would suggest that the, that this that all the municipalities reach out to the folks on the sanctuary who are within their jurisdiction and make their, their feelings known. But um, I, I think that it's, I think that the opportunity for representation already exists. I think that expanding the board uh, too much will, I mean, look how big we are already. And, um, and sitting on, on boards that meet throughout the Keys, I can tell you it is always a nightmare getting enough people every time you change a location. And uh, making the board bigger is not gonna make it any better. Bob Smith. Uh, can anyone here tell me whether uh, there's precedent for uh, participation of municipalities on other advisory councils? Well, I would imagine throughout the advisory council system, there's a local elected official on every one of them. I don't, Sean, maybe you know that, but I think it's just about every advisory council mm -hmm. for a sanctuary has an elected official on, whether it's a local municipal or a County, I don't know that. It's the the representation of a specific municipality. I was wondering, Bob. I may not know. No. No. I mean, there, there are government official seats uh, that, that on, on on most every advisory council, but um, you know that we have that we have the elected official seat right now. This this would be something extra. Maybe. <clears throat> I agree that if we get too large, it becomes unwieldy. I also think that there is a large representation from Key West, and if Mayor Cates or other members want to come and offer public testimony, it's always available at every meeting, and it's not really that you make any different impact sitting here or sitting there. I sat out there for years. And, and you're still heard either way. So I think the opportunity is there. 
and I don't think it's really wise to open it up to this huge burgeoning group of people. Heather, go ahead. You know, honestly, I think also there's something sort of nice about the fact that this is not a, a board that is dominated by elected officials. Um, it, in some way, it keeps politics out of it. And I think when we're talking about, about the preservation of our environment that we all enjoy, um, that's sort of an important thing, and I hate to see it become too much of a political body. Um, Don? I look at this uh, from a, from a, from an educational standpoint. I see and hear so much misinformation by different groups here in Key West. Uh, I like the idea of government officials being on here, but I also like the idea of a representative from the community college, a uh, representative from the high schools. The deal is education. When you have the misinformation that's floating around out there, uh, that could be shortcutted very easily. Uh, the, you know, that seems to me to be a better plan. Thank you. Uh, Dave, maybe please. Here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I might be willing to support the uh, appointment of non-voting um, seats for all the municipalities, which would serve part of the education and communication, um, two-way communication uh, aspect that you're talking about. Um, and I don't know if that can be done any more seamlessly than, uh, than the other, but, um, but I'm not in favor of supporting this move simply because of what I said before. We all done? If I had to weigh in, I would kind of weigh in with Don a little bit. I think having them in the room would, you know, if, if you sat through this thing like you and I have for 15 years, you know, we've heard a lot, and you've heard, you, get, you start to get a sense for where, you know, what's going to work and what's not going to work, and a lot of it goes back to what Jeremy was talking about today. We need to be honest about these things, and you need to be able to, you need to be educated. You need to understand what the issues are. The only way to do that is to be attending a meeting like this where good information is going to be coming to you and to be engaged in. And so having the city of Key West sitting in here at every one of these meetings would bring an educated person into the city council member or some city council meetings. That said, I'm not sure you know, whether that's going to be the best thing or not. And I think there's been some really other good points brought up. And that's just my two cents. And Dave's trying to get another two cents in. That's four cents for you. Yeah, just to see if there's any other interest at the table for this motion, I'm going to, at this point in time now, rescind my second, if I'm allowed to do that. And let's see if there really is, because I wanted the second because I wanted to hear this discussion. But I'm not really for it, so it would be disingenuous for me to keep my second in place. So I withdraw my second for the motion, so unless there's another second, I don't know. Chairman, you're up. Do we have a second? <clears throat> All right. Motion dies. So, we move on. Uh, water quality protection program update. So the water quality protection program meets twice a year. Sean's going to probably tell you everything I would say, so maybe I'll just nip it. Uh, Chris went, I was, um, I, I was in Jamaica, I think, at the time, so I couldn't go, but those are good meetings to go to, believe it or not. Uh, I'll, I'll just do it from here, then. Um, uh, the, um, I'm, I'm doing this for Chris Berg. Uh, Chris is sort of the representative of the advisory council on uh, the, the Porky Sanctuary Water Quality Protection Program Steering Committee. Um, Chris put together uh, the, uh, sort of a briefing of, of, of all the things that happened at that meeting. Uh, those are those are in your packets. I believe available outside. They'll also be available on uh, sort of the meeting materials afterward. I wanted to kind of highlight just a couple things uh, for folks, and, um, and and I'll certainly answer any questions I can. I was going to hand it over to Billy, but he had, he had to take off since he, since he was there as well and sits on that steering committee. 
Um, just as a reminder for folks, uh, the, the Water Quality Protection Program, this was, this was set up uh, along with the Sanctuary Advisory Council uh, in the original 1990 uh, Board of Keys National Marine Sanctuary Protection Act. Uh, so this was put in place by law uh, to bring folks together. Um, in, in, in this case, unlike the Advisory Council, all uh, representatives from all the municipalities uh, to get everyone together and on the same page uh, to address water quality, in particular you know, infrastructure issues, which everyone I think, is very familiar with um, over, over uh, the, the last 20 years, the improvements that needed to be made um, to move along. That program, its, its mission is up here. There was up there, recommend priority corrective actions to address addressing point and non-point sources of pollution to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the sanctuary. Um, so it, it, this, this group it meets um, t uh, twice a year. Uh, th they'll be meeting again in, in the summertime and, and I encourage anyone who's interested in uh, of the variety of water quality issues, and there are a lot of them, uh, to come to those meetings uh, and, and, uh, and kind of hear how things are, are going in terms of the, the updates on all of the different ones. So at, at every meeting, they get an update on wastewater projects throughout the Grove County how things are progressing from municipality to municipality in terms of the infrastructure improvements. A, a huge part of what they've been working on um, is addressing canals and, and canal restoration, so they got uh, updates on that. Uh, Chris and, and, uh, and talked about sea level rise and, and adaptation in Monroe County. There was a presentation from uh, Monroe County on what's being done there. Um, there's been a lot of interest, in, and we actually talked a little bit about this uh, this morning, um, sponge restoration and, and looking at uh, sponge restoration project and its update, the proposal that was uh, is being put forward to look at that, and uh, that's going to be moving forward soon. That's the function of the stuff that you see. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection, um, the, the, they talked about their sampling and, and collaboration efforts. That's Gus Rios' shop and, and the, the work they've been doing. Um, and then uh, also talked about the effects of mosquito control for pesticides on, on non-target organisms. These, uh, these are, there's been several studies on this and, and these are all on the water quality protection website. You can link to it from our website at floridakeys.noa.gov. At each of these, at, at, at these meetings, particularly in the, in the January meeting, there's always an update on the monitoring reports. And so for folks interested in how um, Water quality, the, the coral reef monitoring has been going, the water quality monitoring has been going, the seagrass and, and uh, the, the changes in the, in the benthic habitats um, associated with water quality kind of parameters, all of those were, were provided uh, at the meeting. Again, this is available on the website. And for folks who are interested, just let me know. I, I can get, get you these studies, the, the updated reports. It's, it's very interesting. So, um, and, and again, this happens every year. Um, so the recommendations from the steering committee, the, the big ones that came out of the, out of the meeting, um, there, there was a funding request and a request for proposal put together. This is going to be addressing sponge restoration. Again, that's a high priority. Um, and they also uh, had discussion, and this has been discussion for the last couple of years, to reconstitute their technical advisory committee. Uh, the, the, te the, the technical advisory committee made up of scientists um, to identify, prioritize those special studies that are needed um, to make sure we're spending um, money in the highest and best use for, for to, to address water quality programs. They, they review grant proposals, things like that, and um, because of a lot of the discussion that's been happening over the last year, year and a half, uh, related to shallow versus deep water injection of wastewater, um, it's a, you know, we've really got to reconstitute that scientific committee and, and get that together. And so, so uh, that's, that's going to be coming in the future. And I'll keep everyone updated here on how that's put together. Some of the folks that, that were on the old technical advisory committee have, have, uh, have retired or, or moved on. So we'll be looking for some, some new science. I'm not talking about that. And John's, John's still here. Uh, no, no, no. Folks like uh, Joe Boyer, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so we're going to be kind of reconstituting that technical advisory committee and then and, and sort of retasking them on some, some probably broader scientific questions that are out there. 
And finally, um, as, as always, uh, there's a, a, a public comment, and so there was public comment there about, you know, again, the, the deep well injection uh, at, at Kedjo Regional um, Wastewater Treatment Plant. There was public comment about proposing grinder pumps at, at, uh, for, for that, and then uh, there was public comment in support of more sponge restoration research and, and sponge restoration in general. So, with that, uh, that's kind of the update from the Water Quality Protection Program. Uh, anybody who has additional questions, just come to me. I can get the, dig deeper into some of the information. Chris's report that's in your folders uh, goes into a little bit more detail, but you know, as with everything, really try and get this out on the website and let folks know what's going to be on the next round coming in August. Right. Okay. Comments, questions of Sean? All right. Next item on the agenda. Oh, by the way, if anybody back there wants to make public comment, I think it's at 2.45, you'll need to get a, a sheet from out front and hand it in and give it to Beth right here. So anybody wants to make public comment. Uh, and I think Beth is up next. We're actually going to talk about the Artificial Habitat Working Group and try to give them a, some marching orders. Joe? <coughs> Yes. Okay, uh, so as you may recall, uh, you had passed a motion related to artificial habitats where you identified that you would like a working group formed to look at the issues around artificial habitat use in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. At our last meeting, we uh, the entire meeting was devoted to talking about artificial habitat, primarily the various agencies who have a part in permitting, oversight, or review of artificial habitat uh, placement and use. And from that meeting and discussion, we got a little further on goals and objectives for the work that the Artificial Habitat Working Group would do, elected a, um, well, identified um, a chair in Joe Weatherby and talked about potential membership. So this is our update presentation to you on progress of putting that working group together and next steps. So April, today, a uh, presentation on what um, we are doing and the plan for the future. And we have identified that um, this is tentative, but likely in July we would host a workshop and looking at potential two-day workshop at the Eco Discovery Center in Key West with the goal of convening artificial habitat experts to discuss and clarify the interests, research needs, and policies surrounding the use of artificial habitats in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And obviously, that overarching goal is informed by and has several objectives that build on the discussion we had at the February meeting. And then in August, uh, the working group, Joe, would report back to the advisory council on outcomes and any potential uh, input to the regulatory review process from that working group. And here are some of the more specific objectives for that working group. One is to review the history of artificial use in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Second is to define the purpose of artificial habitat use in the sanctuary. Third is to look at the science and identify any gaps or uh, remaining needs in the science and discuss and identify next steps to clarify the permit process and improve permit compliance as well as looking at funding and liability issues around funding. Finally, these are the range of sectors and interests that have been identified that should be at that table and part of this discussion. Obviously, advisory council members, federal and state agency representatives, local and county agency representatives, non-governmental organization, artificial habitat reef managers, practitioners, scientists, both natural and social, recreational and charter fishers, divers, economists, and there may be a sector that hasn't been identified. 
At that meeting, many of you volunteered to be on that working group, to contribute to that working group. We've also been pulling together a list of other uh, names, individuals who are part of these various sectors and we would like to have part of this discussion. Uh, and that's the next steps are to refine and finalize that list of, of individuals to invite and then schedule the meeting and host the meeting. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very much looking for. I'm very much looking forward to this opportunity um, to kind of hash out some of the pros and cons of artificial reefs. Um, I thought uh, I thought Dr. Jackson's uh, presentation was 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 very compelling until I heard what he had to say about artificial reefs. Clearly, <laughs> clearly he doesn't know a damn thing. But. Uh, but uh, I, I was teasing Dr. Jackson when I assume was your sense of humor, I think he said. Right. Um, a lot of people have asked to be involved in this. I think that there's a, a in building on Dan Bosta's presentations at the last meeting, I think that there's a, there's a lot of opportunity here to identify and move forward with, with, uh, with uh, artificial reefs as one component of a management plan. Uh, my, my, position on uh, the relative benefits of artificial reefs are pretty pretty well known to most people here in the room. A lot of people have have asked to be on this and, and a lot of people are very excited about it. Um, and I think with good reason. I think that uh, uh, to kind of have a new look at this artificial reef based on what uh, artificial reef issue based on what uh, what uh, you know Dan Basta and some of the, the other folks in the leadership have had to say, and I think it's a very timely thing. I think very clearly, based on what Dr. Jackson had to say, that uh, anything that can help should be looked at and evaluated. I think uh, I see the need. Uh, I see the need also to uh, put to rest some of the. You know, there's a lot of thinking out here about artificial reefs that, in my mind, is dated. And I think that this represents maybe a new opportunity to get some fresh eyes on some of these issues. I think that I think that artificial reefs also rec uh, 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 create an opportunity to enhance the fishing and diving experience as well as the research experience here in, here in the Florida Keys. Um, I have been asking some folks around the community for their input on this to better inform some of my thinking um, as far as uh, what, what, what is it that we really need to talk about. And I would ask anybody here in the room that has uh, a, a, an opinion or something to offer that can inform, that can inform the, the framework of the discussion ahead of time, I would love to hear it. Uh, I would like to thank Beth and the staff for, for really making a lot of uh, resources and help available to, to, to frame this uh, opportunity uh, issue, whatever we're calling, I'm calling it an opportunity, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this. But if you have something to say about artificial reefs in regards to any of these issues, I, I would really, really like to hear it ahead of the meeting because we're still kind of talking about some of the topics and some of the some of the uh, priorities uh, that are going to be addressed within a two-day meeting schedule. Um, you know. Uh, when I said you know six or eight days to Sean and Beth, they they uh, they figured we could probably uh, do a little more work on the front end to get a point on some of this stuff, and I'm I'm asking for some help in that regard. So uh, thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, Smith. Jim, oh, yeah. yeah, there's comments. I don't know. Yeah. This is a good time to chat. Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, Okay. You got an idea of when you might be able to set the date for that meeting? Two days is a significant amount of time for people to set aside. Very soon. Very soon. Very soon. So the immediate next steps are obviously pulling together that list of individuals we would like to invite to contribute to this discussion, um, and that's the immediate next step. 
but we will um, schedule the meeting within the next week or so, um, and then as soon as we have that, that list, send out a preliminary invite. And that's what I wanted to say as far as Joe has requested, if, if you have any input, obviously now is a good time, but um, providing that input via email to Joe and myself, as well as the, if you have any other names you'd like to consider including. Yep, okay. Yeah, Joe, I have uh, a comment in the form of two questions with dealing with the artificial reefs. Uh, the first question would be that when you consider an artificial reef, I think it's very important to define the purpose of that reef. And so that would be the first question, what is the purpose of the reef? And the second question would be, if the purpose of the reef is accomplished, uh, what will be the effect on the natural environment of having, uh, having put that reef out there? Yeah, agreed. Uh, agreed to get the, uh, the uh, you know, all of these things, whether it's a beer can or a shopping cart or a, or a Coast Guard a marker buoy or a dock could be under one view classified as artificial reefs. So I think one of the first things that Beth and I went through in, in sort of trying to get, they asked me for, for a lot of information and then, and then we measured that against some of, uh, of what was available within the science and within the policy and now I'm asking everybody else to kind of help lend a hand to kind of define this issue. But where I get to in my thinking, and that's just me, right? I, we're gonna have a, a, a big working group here, but it's all about, um, an artificial reef is less what it is than what it's for and what it's supposed to do, right? It's, it's identified as an artificial reef, at least for the sanctuary purposes, and certainly in some of the other, some of the other policies that we saw at the last meeting it's identified by use. So I think we're gonna be talking about that very early in the conversation of a two-day boarding session. So I agree, I, I, think you're, yeah, I think you're right on the money. Anybody else? So Joe, I think one of the values of uh, the outcome of the meeting, uh, you know, the last meeting we heard all of the, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta you know, we heard how hard it is to get any kind of an artificial reef or any kind of structure put in the water, lots and lots of stuff. And you know, there's all these roadblocks that are, have been erected, and yet if the council, if the Sanctuary Advisory Council, or you know, we could provide some direction and support for a few things that we think these need to be done, then sometimes those roadblocks are easier to come down or there's a way to get around them. And I think the outcome where I'm getting is, I think if the outcome could be some clear direction on what the Sanctuary Advisory Council or what the work group, what kind of projects, what you know, what we would, what we could support. You know where I'm going? You know, yeah, yeah. If, if, if they don't know whether there's any support or not, then the answer is no. If there's a lot of support for something, then the answer is we'll find a way to make it happen. And I'd like to get to where we can find a way to make some of these things happen by lending our support. Well, we could talk about, certainly you, you probably know a little bit about permitting things in, in the sanctuary, and I've, I've had some of the same wonderful experiences <coughs> myself. Um, I would suggest that uh, what Skip has to say about use, purpose, perceived benefit, um, um, take it against what's possible, because you know one of the, the, re the regulations are onerous, and, and uh, that's all there is to it. Um, there's a lot of duplication, and uh, and uh, and I, you know I, I see the reason for regulations. I get it, but I think that uh, a clear path to doing something that's clearly beneficial, defined by the use, to give the sanctuary uh, advisory council and, and the regular and the regulatory uh, infrastructure an easier way to go. I think is a successful and and a. And a uh, a doable and, and, and valuable goal for, for the work. So I agree. That's, that's what you should be going for. Good. Any other comments on that? I'll lay it all out. All right, well, we're running ahead of schedule. So we uh, take a break or do some agency reports and then take a break and then do public comments. Well, we're going to do public comment, but it's scheduled for 2.45. I didn't know whether everybody's coming. 
back at 245. So we could uh, do some agency reports and start on that. And we'll take a break at 2.30, so in, in uh, about 10 minutes or so we'll take a break and then we'll come back, do the public comment, and then finish up agency reports. So go ahead and start, Sean. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm just quick. Uh, just one of the things that you know, well, you know, we kind of go over here. What we're working on this is this is uh, obviously pretty dominant for what uh, we're working on in terms of the zoning review. Um, a couple upcoming things in terms of the, the year ahead. We're, we're, we're this is our 25th anniversary year uh, for for the National Marine Sanctuary. So one of the things we're going to be working on is. Uh, working towards a, kind of a larger celebration coming up in November, so November 16th is the 25th anniversary. So, um, some of you, um, if not uh, all of you, probably a booth will be reaching out to you to talk about, um, you know, ways to kind of get involved in something like that. And I've already started reaching out to some constituents, um, and you know, to kind of bring everyone together for for that uh, event. Um, a little closer to kind of where we are now. Uh, um, in June, there's kind of a couple big things happening. One, um, and, and I'll get information out to the advisory council list on this, but uh, this doesn't happen too often. But, but we're going to have both the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council and the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council both meeting here in Key West, um, and that's the week of, of June 8th. We're going to be here the 8th through the 12th. Um, some of the meetings are. are Together uh, uh, and some separate. There's a lot on that agenda. Some of it uh, is uh, the South Atlantic looking at special management zones. Um, primarily, Rock, you know, most of this is a little bit farther to the north, but they are going to be holding scoping meetings here in Key West as well. So look for uh, look for emails from me on that. Uh, the other thing, uh, big thing, kind of coming up in June is uh, we've got the one of the large NOAA research vessels, the Nancy Foster, is going to be uh, here for about two weeks. Um, actually, maybe four weeks, because uh, that's right. There's, there's two cruises, not just sanctuary stuff. So there's going to be a, a, a large white research vessel coming up uh, through, the, through the Keys, uh, doing work for different parts of NOAA, including the National Marine Sanctuary, uh, a lot, um, and, and as well as we're having scientists from Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission on board looking at a variety of uh, kind of different science questions throughout the Florida Keys and out to the Tortugas. So those are those are kind of the big things coming up uh, with the sanctuary we saw on our horizon, as well as other events that you'll hear from me on. Um, I guess John, see the next. Yes. Oh, okay. Go ahead, John. <laughs> Um, let me just uh, expand a little bit on the joint council meetings. Go back in time, you folks have recommended uh, trying to have a more consistent approach on South Florida fishery management, a more regional approach, if you will. You recall some of you re recommended that there be a completely separate fishery management council, um, and it's that issue. That South Florida Management Committee, which is comprised of members of the Gulf Council and the South Atlantic Council, and I'm uh, uh, help them with kind of background science information as does in the Clark area. We'll be meeting at that uh, at the joint council meetings, and I'm, if I recall correctly, but I'm fairly certain that 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 committee will be kind of putting out some the first round of recommendations for the for each council to consider. So that's kind of a, really been in response to the Sanctuary Advisory Council uh, requests. And for those of you that are interested, at some point during that week they'll that committee will be meeting. I don't I don't know exactly when, but just check it out if, if you're interested. On commission news, uh, we had a commission meeting last week. Although I wasn't there, and I was focused uh, working for uh, my capacity uh, on the Moat Marine Lab license plate uh, advisory board, so I'm not that aware of what we did other than in the marine world, other than what was on the consent agenda. And so, for those people that are interested, the the consent agenda included the allowing commercial divers 
to transfer their licenses. And that is now a fait accompli. Um, and I, I assume, now, and I'm using the word assume because I didn't read the consent agenda itself, <coughs> that it will be effective on July 1st, which is the first day of the fiscal year. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, and that's the consent uh, agendas for commercial lobster dining. Cons right? com commercial lobster dining. Okay. So, and so effective at that point, if you're a commercial lobster diver, you could sell your license just in the same way a commercial tracker can sell a tracker. So, another thing. Joanna? Good afternoon, everybody from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I've got a couple of updates for you um, from our friends at John Pennycamp uh, State Park. Um, they are still working on their updates to their unit management plan, so please. Uh, stay advised with that. Um, we've had record public attendance at the park lately and um, have just had a lot on their plates that are continuing to engage the public in on, um, ongoing shoreline and reef and green cleanups. <coughs> Heading up north a little bit to our, uh, our sisters in the north, uh, the Florida Conservation Program is still working with the Our Florida Reefs Community Planning Process. Um, again, a similar to this process, they've had um, a team and some community working groups uh, working to develop recommended management actions <coughs> in the northern part of the Florida Reef Draft. Over the past year, they've developed kind of just a brainstorm list of over 200 actions um, that they are now trying to whittle down and scope out some more detail on. Um, so they've whittled down to um, roughly 100 and 120-ish that they are now working to um, with the, with the uh, Southeast Florida Coral Reef Initiative team to kind of refine and uh, eventually prioritize. This month, the working groups are actually being introduced to a software called the Decision Support Tool. Actually, Dr. Jackson uh, mentioned it, a uh, similar concept. It's, it's a software that presents all of the data that we have for that region over the last 10 years um, in a spatial format and allows the groups to manipulate um, based on where the highest coral cover is, where the most fish are, and your proximity to inlets, things like that, and will allow them to create actual draft recommendations of where they, um, some of their actions should be placed spatially. Uh, going up to the national level, uh, I'm sitting here with uh, the director of the Florida Coastal Office, Kevin Claridge, who uh, represents the state of Florida with me on the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force. Uh, we met back in February uh, and have really, I think, a mentioned before that we've really been shifting the attention to the fact that we are <coughs> continuing an alarming decline uh, with the reefs and that status quo just isn't really working. And so the task force itself who works across all of the U.S. jurisdictions that have coral reefs, uh, we are working to do some strategic planning this year because uh, even though we are all working on some very important priority efforts, we just need to be more efficient and more effective. Uh, and so we're going to hopefully uh, by February of next year have a very refined uh, work plan that will hopefully move, move us forward. Um, excuse me. So uh, during our due diligence for the state of Florida, uh, Kevin and I have taken that message to the new secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection, Secretary Steverson, uh, and we gave her kind of A to Z coral reef presentation to him, just helping him understand um, all that we're doing here in Florida, both um, the, the local threats, uh, as well as all the local management efforts that we're doing, and he was really receptive. Um, he himself is a resource user. He actually used to snorkel here in the Keys quite a bit and lobster quite a bit, but saw a change in resources, a decline in resources, and has shifted his use based on that. So he actually has a personal connection to the reefs uh, especially here in the Keys. So he was very supportive of our efforts both uh, with our Florida Reefs and the work that you all are doing here. Um, so we hope to bring him down for the 25th anniversary uh, and, and make sure to, to engage him in all of the work that you guys are doing. Uh, and I actually wanted to echo John's uh, invitation to Dr. Jackson uh, to, <laughs> we're gonna tag team him a little bit on the state agency side because I think um, although it is <coughs> nice to hear from internal agency representatives, it is often better when external uh, experts uh, bring the message to our higher ups. And I think Dr. Jackson does a, an eloquent job of uh, providing some really complex information in a very succinct way. So that is all I have to do. 
Again, just Kevin Claridge from uh, the EP's Postal Office. It's alley. Stick my head in. I think about every third or fourth meeting, but it always is good to, to see everybody and, and catch up and always put put a face uh, with everyone. And uh, as Joanna mentioned, we are doing our our due diligence in Tallahassee to socialize, if you will, the, the things that are going on down in the Keys through the sanctuary to make it a comfortable conversation so they are informed. Uh, whether it's the, the detailed presentations with the secretary or even my boss, the deputy secretary, what's going on down here. And, uh, kind of the next steps, and agency actions, and uh, public involvement, and so forth. But also try to do the fun things of like Earth Day, you know, things like that coming up this this weekend, and, and sharing the good things that are going on. Or uh, uh, through uh, Ocean's Day, which is a month or two back at the Capitol, and, and sharing the good things that are going on in, in, in the Keys. So, uh, if anybody has any questions for me, you always come up and say hello. But just wanted to. Uh, Make sure I, I showed up today as a uh, representative from Tallahassee and to support Joanna's position as well as uh, some agency meetings uh, the next few days here in the Keys. All right, let's uh, take a 15 minute break. We'll come back with part comment and finish up on your announcing. Perfect. Sorry, Dave. It's all good. Don't worry. <laughs>
to emphasize the importance of, of that as this process moves forward. Um, a second item I wanted to discuss today has to do with shallow injection wells. Um, since I last mentioned anything about the shallow injection wells for um, wastewater, um, FKAA and the Board of County Commissioners 
have approved and decided to move forward with deep injection wells at Kajo, which is great. Um, there was a study done, uh, tracer dye study, showing that the effluent from um, shallow injection wells, wells would make it up to the surface waters. Um, it's very concerning. Uh, I really applaud FKA and um, the BOCC for moving forward with that. However, in the meantime, Stock Island, um, under the supervision of DEP, is moving forward with shallow injection wells. Um, and I think given the new information, given the, the position that BOCC and FKA have taken at this point, and what the study from Dr. Bersano showed, it would be a prudent time for this body to take a position um, on shallow injection wells and urge the SAC to <coughs> pass a resolution to send a letter to take a position and ask DEP to require deep injection wells at, at Stock Island. Um, they're increasing their capacity dramatically um, at that sewage treatment facility and they will be injecting the wastewater only you know, 120 feet down and we can expect that that will be coming up to the surface and impacting the water quality. <coughs> so, um, but, this, can, this council can take that into consideration today. Um, the third thing I wanted to alert folks to is uh, some legislation that has been proposed in the U.S. Senate. It's gone through committee in the U.S. Senate and is now um, assigned to committee in the House. And it would essentially remove the role of the sanctuary in any enforcement or being able to you know, prohibit discharges of gray water as we've asked for within the sanctuary boundaries. Um, so any best incidental vessel discharges, so bilge water, gray water, um, anything essentially beyond um, sewage and um, oil um, would be significantly weakened largely in terms of the regulation of vessel discharges. Um, so the sanctuary and NOAA would really no longer have the role they play in regulating vessel discharges. That would go to the Coast Guard and a lot of vessels. Um, any vessels less than 79 feet, fishing vessels, military vessels, recreational vessels, um, become exempt from all these vessel discharge regulations. So uh, we find it to be concerning um, legislation. I know the SAC itself cannot take a position on that, but I hope as individuals, your con you'll contact your Congress people, your representatives, and, and ask um, to, to oppose this legislation. Um, I will be working on a letter on this and some other points on, on this legislation, so please feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like to do anything about it. It's Senate Bill um, 373. So um, that is all I have today, but thank you for your time and um, consideration. Billy, uh, Richard, or Bryce Barr? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bryce Barr. I'm the president of the QS Charter Boat Association. Um, I just have a couple of quick comments. Um, one was about the DEIS. Uh, it keeps coming up about the misinformation and rumors. Um, I'd like to comment on the charts that are being analyzed for the DEIS. The working group, headed specifically by uh, Mr. Chris Bird. Um, we had an additional meeting, uh, meetings, like 60 regional meetings, which I had to take days off to go to. And um, we all made a lot of comments and recommendations. Um, they were made by a wide variety of user groups. We were under the understanding that the working group was going to reconsider the original lines that were drawn on the charts, which was not, which, which does not seem to be the case. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <clears throat> Some of the considerations seem to be overwhelmingly opposed, yet they still seem to be moving forward and considering by the SAC. The process seems to already be decided. Beth said that there will be updated charts with lines on them. The DEIS is being considered and worked on. There has to be areas of recommended boundaries in order to even do the study. It's disappointing to me that all these recommended changes and closures affect so many people and their livelihoods, 
yet only one person out of the 30 people that were here this morning, Mr. Rob Harris, had a question about what is really going on. With regard to the uh, spawning aggregations, we have openly re uh, endorsed a reduction in bag limits of species that state with the best available, uh, the state says with the best available science are not in danger. We can live with reductions of bag limits of certain species. Let's manage the fish, not the spot. As far as the fish pictures that were compared by Dr. Jeremy Jackson, um, we still catch a lot of the fish that he depicted in the pictures. Uh, we just release them. Uh, the Goliath groups, you know, Goliath groupers seem to be, you know, healthier than ever. And back then those fish weren't managed and now they are. Um, there's a lot of reasons those pictures don't even make sense when you compare them. Um, one was, the, you know, there's no bag limits back then. Uh, the time of year, one captain may have been better than another. It could have been, well, there's, there's weather as a factor. There's just numerous variables. So it's really difficult to compare the way something was and the way something is now. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel all the way around the world. I've been to Bermuda, I've been to the Galapagos and other destinations. I've been diving in these places. I'm not a scientist, um, but I have been on the reefs in these locations and it is as beautiful as ours. Um, Places like Bermuda has less population. They have volcanic formations, which are completely different than ours. And uh, we can all agree that there's a lot of pressure on our coral reefs and numerous factors, and they're not all attributed to fishing. Natural phenomenons that are completely out of our hands can attribute to these. Uh, if we can focus on the water quality, we can help save our reefs. Um, with the spas that are in place now, Dr. Jackson says the problem is overfishing, yet the spas are open only to diving, and they are on the decline. How can we say that fishing is a culprit when there are no spas with fishing only? Yet he says we blame everything, on, like the fishermen blame everything on sunblock. I'm a diver and I love diving. It just needs to go both ways. Um, we just ask that the recommend, recommendations be fair to all user groups and that we are still able to make a, uh, make a living. Closing giant areas is the ultimate fishery management. Thank you. Richard and then uh, David Moran will be next. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Richard Gomez, a uh, board member with the Charter Boat Association and past president. I can certainly agree with one statement by Mr. Jackson. Uh, he said that if you close off a third of the reef track, things would probably improve on the reef. Obviously so. But he, what he is asking, in my opinion, is to kill our city because those tourists that are buying the trinkets, as he said, in our shops, would probably not be here if it wasn't for them wanting to enjoy our ocean and our fishery. You know, I'm, I'm sure that fishermen are not the enemy of the sanctuary. What I'm not so sure of is that the sanctuary is not the enemy of the fishermen. Especially after that wonderful speech that blamed fishermen for so much of the problem with our ecosystem. And adding insult to injury, this gentleman blamed parrotfish and surgeon fish I've never heard of a parrotfish or surgeon fish fishery, and I don't think I ever will. <clears throat> Among other herbivores, for the increase in microalgae, when during many of these meetings that I've attended, without quoting me, I would say that I heard that microalgae was caused by many factors, possibly the least of which was fishing. And we certainly can't be blamed for the die-off of sea urchins. I've never heard of one of those fisheries either. And wow, I am so surprised that the sanctuary would not welcome the mayor or city commissioner to be a part of this process that has so much to do with the future of our city. And if one more member would be so detrimental to the sanctuary process, as if one more member would be that detrimental to the process, 
And speaking of the city reps, with, which were very few in this sanctuary, how many of them have asked or spoken to the city of the plans for the sanctuary which are going to have such a dramatic effect on the city's future? Besides Sean Morton, which would have never bothered with the city if it wasn't for the association blowing the whistle as loud as we could. You have set a bad example and furthered the fishermen's feeling that we are being singled out as the weakest link. Shame on all of you. And God willing, because of your negative response, more power to us. And as our whisper for fair treatment becomes a shout, my hopes would be that you will all be held accountable for your constant attack on the weakest link. That's all. Thank you, Richie. David? That's a hard act to follow. Uh, your first speaker, Julie Dick, I'm not her. I'm not being paid. I'm here because I've been here for 43 years practicing law and diving and enjoying the environment and having kids and grandchildren. Your staff position is that closing zones to any commercial or recreational fishing is not fishery management. Folks, it's a duck. The issue is, do you really want to know what's going on behind the scenes with regard to this concept of marine zoning? You voted to send some of the working group recommendations up for the draft environmental impact statement. Now, how many of you knew what areas you were actually recommending for the environmental impact statement? How many of you knew what actual areas you were recommending? Raise your hand. You did. You ever seen a map of those areas? I asked for it. I asked for it. I asked for it in emails a number of times. And so let's do this. Let's let me read you two emails, and these are within minutes of each other. 12:11 p.m. on February the 11th, and 3:18 p.m. The first one is from Beth. Um, to Mr. To Tamara with the county commissioner, and it said, quote, the recommended zones and changes that have been worked with the advisory council working groups has not been finalized to be put into maps yet, close quote. Then at uh, 3.48 p.m., to Rich Jones, it says, quote, the sanctuary staff is now doing an environmental and economic impact analysis of the advisory council recommendations that will be released as a draft environmental impact statement for advisory council and public review and comment in late 2015. You can't have it both ways. If you don't have the map, how do you do a environmental impact statement that includes the environment, economic impact, and etc. Now, you will get a draft environmental impact statement. There's going to be three or four alternatives that will be given to you. The smaller of the proposed alternatives will be the least restrictive. And most of you will vote for the least restrictive alternative, and it'll pass. And what you probably won't realize is that the closures you will vote on is the result that a few of you started out to close. You may or may not realize it, but your process is being pursued on your proposed marine zoning is to divide and conquer. Have the dive operators support closures against the recreational and commercial fishermen. Have the backcountry guides oppose the charter boats. Folks, it's a duck. 
It is in fact under the Magnuson Act. It's the only way we can ever attack it as being too much. If you look, I've got a book back there that thick and it's just been published and it's called America's Fishery Resources. Do you know it never mentions the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary or any other marine sanctuary? Why is that? Because fish aren't within your purview. You will find that out ultimately. But there will be a federal district court judge that says, hey, it's a duck. It's fishery management. And you're not supposed to be doing it. Okay, it's the last uh, public comment name I have on here. If there was anybody else uh, missed it. Um, let's continue with our agency reports. I'm not sure. I think they. Yeah, it's my turn. Here we go. <laughs> Captain David E. Pray with Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, we recently had a, uh, a new colonel put into place, Colonel um, Curtis Brown. Um, with the new colonel comes new ideas, so we are currently going through a reorganization process. Um, there will be some changes made. <clears throat> there are several proposals on the board, but right now, one of the re uh, reorganizations we're taking place in law enforcement is a change in how our investigation section, our operations section, we have resource investigators, we have boating accident investigators, we're going to be putting them together, they'll be cross uh, training and working in each other's areas. Hopefully the idea there will be to get more um, investigative resources out into the field. Right now, our operations, our daily patrols, uh, you know, checking of uh, boating safety, checking of marine fisheries, these basic tasks are being taken up a great deal. We need more investigators. We're also expected to get more investigators, uh, investigative positions, which would bring us to 54 positions in the Keys. With new recruits coming out of the academy, we'll have five more coming down by December. We will be fully staffed. It's the first time we've been fully staffed. Every position filled in uh, at least a few years. Uh, we always have a high turnover. So we'll take advantage of what we can. Uh, we'll be training a total of uh, eight recruits altogether by, by um, December, uh, which is going to take a lot of time, but we're going to put that in there. Hopefully with the new investigative reorganization and a uh, whole staffing of officers, we're going to do well. Right now, the proposal would be, I would take over operations for all the keys from Key Largo to Key West. Captain Baton would handle all the investigative sections for Dade, Collier, and Monroe. We would still be under, um, under um, Major Escaño as the, as the head of the, the region. I think, uh, having experienced this before, it'll be much more advantageous to have all our investigators working together more closely. I expect we'll have a better opportunity to do more in-depth resource investigations, which is what we need. So I'm pretty excited about that. I was listening to the, uh, to the presentation that Dr. Jackson gave, and one of the things that was occurring to me was uh, what we can do, what we're trying to do to make things better. Again, the reorganization, I think, would make things better. Hopefully, uh, work logistics a little better, and we can do a, uh, be more effective in our job. One of the things I was looking at is our, our statistics. You know, right now, probably every week we make 10 fisheries cases. That's from the smallest, let's say, to the largest, where we, you know, the smallest, the guy gets a warning because he's got one under a side snapper. And the largest being we take three or four people to jail with the traps and the lobster that they've taken and seize the boat and then do all that kind of stuff. But there's about 10 cases that we make every week um, annually. You're looking at um, over 500 fisheries cases. Statistically speaking, when we're talking about criminal activity, fish and wildlife is no different. Um, most of the police agencies out there say that they'll they'll catch maybe 10 percent overall of all the different types of crimes. You know, you throw your narcotics, um, rapes, murders, drugs, and everything. Put it all together, they're catching about 10 percent of the criminals out there. Well, when you're talking about 600, or excuse me, over 500 violations a year that we know we're catching, 
um, if we're catching 500 and that's the 10 percent, my gosh, that leaves us a lot of stuff that we're not catching, a lot of things we're not doing uh, and that we're not getting to the bottom of. So again, I always appeal to, the, to this body to continue to push for, one, more law enforcement. Because while I'm telling you we're going to be fully staffed by the end of December, that's great. That will be 54 positions full. Well, we all know within six months we'll have transfers out. We'll be back down. We won't have as many positions because people are coming and going to the Keys all the time. We need more law enforcement. We need to do a better job. We need to have the eyes in the streets. I, I would in, uh, encourage this body to, to continue to push for not just us, but for our federal partners. Um, the eyes and the ears are the people here, your friends, your constituents, the people you work with, the people you work for. We need to get the phone calls. Our internet crimes uh, services are going through the roof, but most of that is, uh, is, is are minor things. Kids, for example, harvesting alligators illegally and putting them on Facebook. <laughs> Luckily, people, criminals, aren't really the smartest sometimes, and, and that's an advantage we have. But there are a lot of smart criminals out there too, and they're very well organized, and they're doing a fine job of what they're doing. And we need the help of everybody to continue to get out there and find these problems. We are currently working some new angles recently. We had one group accuse another group of uh, taking advantage. Uh, stone crab traps are, are being put out with these flexible throats that are large at the top. They meet the, they meet the measurement requirements at the bottom, but they're large at the top. And so lobster can conveniently fit in them and maybe, maybe squeeze into the, into the stone crab traps. Things like this are always going on. These are things we're always contending with. So we'll be going into commission to discuss some of those issues whether we need to standardize certain things and be more strict on our measurements so we catch stone crab in these and we catch lobsters in these and we're not putting stone crabs out trying to catch lobsters, which is what we're told is happening in some cases. Um, nevertheless, our guys have been doing a great job right now. Uh, again, about 10 cases a week is what we've been doing. I did the, the time for the entire quarter from January through now. Um, boating safety is going very well. Uh, we have not had be one or two fatalities, which is phenomenal, which is great right now for this time of year. Our BUI team, Boating Under the Influence teams, have been doing great. They've been hitting Monroe and Dade County pretty hard. We've been making a number of Boating Under, of boating under the Influence cases, not just cases where we're taking somebody to jail because they look a little bit intoxicated might be on the edge. We're catching some people out there who are really fatally um, intoxicated to the point where if we hadn't found them when we did, bad things were going to happen to a lot of people. So our, I, I give kudos to our teams out there doing the boating under the influence. We've got some great officers who really enjoy that. They've been traveling through the entire state um, up to uh, the White Trash Bash, up to um, the, the, uh, the Barry Boatings. I know I love saying White Trash Bash. Isn't that great? And then uh, and, and Barry, the, the buddy Barry, Joey, Tommy Bowlegs. Uh, which is another one on the west coast, but they've got tons and tons of boating going on. People rafted off to each other, trying to see how much they can all drink. Well, look, it's, it's fine, and, and you're allowed to drink on a boat, but being intoxicated to the point where you're going to injure yourself or someone else, it's a crime. It's a crime. So, um, on behalf of FWC, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for your presentation, and uh, thank all of you for listening. All right. Um, let's go around to Michelle with the uh, Coast Guard. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't have much to pass. We haven't had any major cases really since field review in the last meeting. Um, Derelict vessels remains one of our strong initiatives with Mr. Dupree here, uh, which is not many since the last meeting. Um, hurricane season is approaching us, so we are focused on hurricane exercise next month. And the term might not be familiar with you guys, but it is for us, ICS, Institute of Command Structure. So we're working on getting everybody uh, qualified for hurricane season. And that's really all I have. Kenny Blackburn, I'm NOAA Fisheries uh, Special Agent, uh, two, one of two criminal investigators in the Florida Keys. And um, give us some staff changes. Um, our deputy director has uh, moved.
moved on to another uh, position with another agency. So now we're down our director and our deputy director, and uh, we're also vacant a uh, one of our next line supervisors for my region. So, um, we're down to I think somewhere around 89 special agents um, for the country, um, including uh, Hawaii and uh, America Samoa, Puerto Rico, some of the other outlying areas. Um, so we have two here. That's a big deal. <laughs> but we're we're expecting to get uh, some enforcement officers hired on within the next uh, two to three months, and I hope that we get some here as well. Uh, we've been hiring on. I think we've, we've hired on uh, about 30 so far, and uh, some of those have already reported in for duty. One of them was Joe Scarpa, who used to be the Peter Gladding captain with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. He's now a supervisor uh, enforcement officer in Hawaii. So we're pretty excited to have him because of his, his experience with the federal room and with, with the state. So I'll try to keep, keep it brief, but I'm not good at that. So. Um, <laughs> We had, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Operation Rock Bottom. I'll give you a brief synopsis on that just for the public. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing about it, but um, we've been doing it for four years now um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and under the direction of the Department of Justice. Um, it's been a series of cases dealing with the international legal import and export um, trade of marine life species from companies in South Florida. Um, this was dubbed Operation Rock Bottom. Um, it was initiated from informants and um, cooperating sources here in the Florida Keys, which I'm sure a lot of you guys probably have figured out who it is by now, but anyway, uh, <laughs> these sources uh, have helped us uh, to get information and to obtain um, search warrants, probable cause, um, and uh, perform multiple um, indictments on um, We've done 13 warrants so far, including Florida, Michigan, and Idaho, and we've uh, done arrest warrants on 18 individuals. Uh, it's a 15-phase uh, operation, and we're currently on, I think, uh, phase 12, somewhere like that. So it's winding down. But um, what we've had is every time we make a case and we arrest someone, well, they wind up giving us more and more information. So it's a kind of a Pandora's box that never seems to go away. And uh, if you don't, I'll be doing these for. Right, made her my career. Uh, the one thing that we had, I mentioned um, Bob Kelton and DR Imports and his general manager, Bruce Brand. They're out of Miami. Um, they had a change of plea last time we met and they had their sentencing within the last two months. Um, DR Imports is a large wholesale exporter of marine life invertebrates and tropical fish in the South Florida area in Miami. Um, it stands for Dominican Republic Imports, even though um, he deals mainly with Haiti. Um, after search warrants on DR Imports and multiple surveillances and subpoenas and a lot of time and effort, um, we were able to determine $1.5 million of illegal CITES marine life that was knowingly harvested from the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and then it was illegally exported, falsely labeled as a um, originating from the country of Haiti. Um, this, this was a very hard case. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to one day go in depth on how hard this case was. It took four years, and um, this was the main target of Operation Rock Bob. Um, he did a plea deal, um, which uh, made the sentencing uh, on him on the 24th. Um, ultimately, the judge gave him two years of imprisonment, followed by three years of supervised release and a $200 special assessment. Um, Bruce Brand, his general manager, received one year uh, and one day of imprisonment, followed by one year of supervised release and a $200 special assessment. Um, Kelton, um, he received a 5K motion uh, for his cooperation um, with investigators. That means he received a downward departure to what his initial, um, uh, what he initially would have made as a sentence because he cooperated with us helping us um, find new individuals. And uh, we have multiple spinoff cases from that. Um, the next thing that uh, really that we're doing within the last two months is we also have the sentencing change of plea for the Beach brothers. Um, those are three brothers here in Key West that are um, charter boat commercial fishermen. Um, but 
Um, what we got them on was um, the place of illegal lobster habitat and fishing off that habitat, which is illegal. Um, that was a Lacey Act violation. Um, and right now, uh, they're awaiting um, the final uh, sentencing portion of what they're going to get. Um, and they have to remove their um, casitas, their artificial, illegally placed artificial habitat um, from the backcountry. And we're doing that right now. That's why John's not here. He's actually on a boat supervising the, um, them pulling out uh, their stuff. They, they contracted out. They're not actually pulling it out. They paid someone to go do it. Um, and uh, so far, within the last week, we've gotten about two 20-yard dumpsters full of marine debris. Um, it, it's all metal. Um, it's all very heavy, heavy metals and uh, concrete um, that would be damaging um, our environment in some areas out there. Um, other than that, I've got uh, one more thing. We had a we had a agent go to Honduras um, to help them with some of their import export um, trade um, laws that they're working on. Um, uh, Tony Rodriguez out of Miami. And uh, you know, the only thing I really want to put in is that on the radio I heard that um, the National uh, Weather Service is going to be flying into Marathon. I don't know if you want to throw that one out for me, but I figure since we're all one NOAA. Um, on the 8th, they're coming down, and they're coming down uh, Hurricane Hunter, and I think it's open to the public. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let that go to Sean when he wants to give that out. That's it. Hurricane Hunter's coming off the There you go. Final <laughs> 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 point. All right, I'll well done. Do get it to him. And the, and the Hurricane Hunter uh, t shirts are for sale on the Mr. Discovery Center. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think uh, Ed Barham with the U.S. Navy, the last person. Um, okay. Um, every five years, we do a series of surveys um, for natural resources, and it's that time again. So this year, we'll be doing surveys for the endangered rice rat. Um, we're currently doing a shorebird survey. We'll be doing a small tooth sawfish survey. And then every year, we do our crocodile surveys, our lower keys marsh rabbit surveys. And, um, and then, of course, we only are doing exotic removal this year. Um, we got about $85,000 to do um, Australian pine removal. Um, we're focusing on, on Trumbo Point annex this year. And um, our Boca Chica Marina has been a BEP designated clean marina for 14 years. It was the first federal facility in Florida to be designated a clean marina. And this year, we're being designated a resilient marina by the DEP, and um, I think this may be the first resilient marina in the state of Florida. All right, Sean, uh, I'll just say it, but just, uh, just the last thing, uh, unfortunately, uh, Billy had to leave, but uh, the reason he is leaving, uh, he had to go to meetings, but he's uh, going to be up in uh, Everglades where. Uh, the president tomorrow is going to be making his first day speech uh, about sea level rise, and, and so it's always a big deal so it, 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 around the government, around the country. You know, where does the president go on Earth? And so it's kind of an honor for South Florida to get the president to come. So he's going to be there. He's probably going to try and slip a filter in his <laughs> <laughs> I know he's going to come, but you know where he All right. We're done on time, a little early. Uh, the next meeting is going to be a marathon at the Marathon Hyatt. Not real sure what that is, but I'll figure it out. Casablanca. Ferro Blanco. Yeah, that's the old place. Okay. Okay, that's at the old Ferro Blanco in town, Hyatt. Anyway, that's about the middle marathon on the bay side, so let's call it a side. Um, I don't think there's anything else. We have the, the other meeting coming up in July, too, and that those dates will be posted, uh, artificial habitat meeting. And I think that's it. So have a safe drive home. Thank you for everybody coming. Bye. Thanks.